Good evening and welcome to Plague Spear and Company. This is week 10 of our reading series and tonight we are pleased to bring you the second installment in the first Henriad, Henry IV, Part 1. Sit back and relax and enjoy. Thank you. So shaken as we are, so wan with care, find we a time for frighted peace to pant and breathe, short-winded accents of new broils to be commenced in strands afar remote. No more the thirsty entrance of this soil shall daub her lips with her own children's blood. No more shall trenching war channel her fields, nor bruise her flowerets with armed hoofs of hostile paces those opposed eyes, which, like the meteors of a troubled heaven, all of one nature, of one substance bred, did lately meet in the intestine shock and furious close of civil butchery, shall now, in mutual well-beseeming ranks, march all one way and be no more opposed against acquaintance, kindred, and allies. The edge of war like an ill-sheathed knife, no more shall cut his master. Therefore, my friends, as far as to the sepulcher of Christ, whose soldier now under whose blessed cross we are impressed and engaged to fight, forthwith a power of English shall we levy, whose arms were molded in their mother's womb to chase these pagans in those holy fields, over whose acres walked those blessed feet, which 1400 years ago were nailed for our advantage on the bitter cross. But this our purpose is now twelve month old, and bootless tis to tell you we will go. Therefore we meet not now. Then let me hear of you, my gentle cousin Westmoreland, what yesternight our council did decree in forwarding this dear expedience. My liege, this haste was hot in question and many limits of the charge set down but yesternight, when all athwart there came a post from Wales loaded with heavy news whose worst was that the noble Mortimer leading the men of Herefordshire to fight against the irregular wild Glendower was by the rude hands of that Welshman taken, a thousand of his people butchered, upon whose dead corpse were such misuse, such beastly shameless transformation by those Welshwomen done as may not be without much shame retold or spoken of. It seems, then, that the tidings of this broil break off our business for the Holy Land. This matched with other did, my gracious lord, for more uneven and unwelcome news came from the north, and thus it did import. On Holy Rood Day, the gallant Hotspur there, young Harry Percy, and brave Archibald, that ever valiant and approved Scot, at Holden met, where they did spend a sad and bloody hour as by discharge of their artillery and shape of likelihood, the news was told. For he that brought them in the very heat and pride of their contention did take horse, uncertain of the issue in any way. Here is a dear, a true industrious friend, Sir Walter Blunt, new lighted from his horse, stained with the variation of each soil betwixt that Holmden and this seat of ours, and he hath brought us smooth and welcome news. The Earl of Douglas is discomfited. Ten thousand bold Scots, two and twenty knights, balked in their own blood, did Sir Walter see on Holmden's plains. Of prisoners, Hotspur took Mordake, Earl of Fife, and eldest son to beaten Douglas, and the Earl of Ethel, of Murray, Angus, and Menteith. And is not this an honorable spoil? <laughs> A gallant prize, huh? Ha, huh? cousin, <laughs> is it not? In faith, it is a conquest for a prince to boast of. <laughs> Yea, there thou makes me sad and makes me sin in envy that my lord Northumberland should be the father to so blessed a son, a son who is the theme of honor's tongue, amongst a grove the very straightest plant, who is sweet fortune's minion and her pride whilst I, by looking on the praise of him, see riot and dishonor stain the brow of my young Harry. <laughs> that it could be proved that some night-tripping fairy had exchanged in cradle clothes our children where they lay and called mine Percy his Plantagenet. 
then would I have his Harry and he mine. But let him from my thoughts. <clears throat> what think you, cuz, of this young Percy's pride? The prisoners which he in, his, in this adventure hath surprised to his own use he keeps, and sends me word, I shall have none but Mordek, Earl of Fife. This is his uncle's teaching. This is Worcester malevolent to you in all aspects, which makes him prune himself and bristle up the crest of youth against your dignity. <laughs> but I have sent for him to answer this. And for this cause a while we must neglect our holy purpose to Jerusalem. Cousin, on Wednesday next our council we will hold at Windsor. So inform the lords. But come yourself with speed to us again, for more is to be said and to be done than out of anger can be uttered. I will, my leech. Oh, now, Hal, oh, what time of day is it, lad? Ah, oh, it's so fat witted with the drinking of old sack and unbuttoning thee after supper and sleeping upon benches after noon that thou hast forgotten to demand that truly which thou wouldst truly know. What the devil has thou to do with the time of day? Uh, unless hours were cups of sack and minutes capons and clocks, the tongues of bods and dials, the signs of leaping houses and the blessed sun himself. A fair hot wench in flame-colored taffeta. I see no reason why thou should be so superfluous as to demand the time of day. Indeed, you come near me now, Hal. For we take purses go we that take purses go by the moon, the seven stars, and not by Phoebus he, that wandering knight so fair. And I prithee, sweet wag, when thou art king. And uh, oh God, save thy grace, majesty, I should say. For grace thou wilt have none. What none? <laughs> no, by my troth, not so much as will serve to be prolonged to an egg and butter. Oh, then, come, roundly, roundly. Why, I marry then, sweet wag. When thou art king, let not us that are squires of the knight's body be called thieves of the day's beauty. Let us be Diana's foresters, gentlemen of the shade, minions of the moon, and let men say we be men of good government, being governed as the sea is by our noble and chaste mistress, the moon, whose countenance we steal. All right, thou sayest well, and it holds well too, for the fortune of us that are the moon's men doth ebb and flow like the sea, being governed as the sea is by the moon. As for proof now, a purse of gold most resolutely snatched on Monday night and most dissolutely spent on Tuesday morning, got with swearing, lay by, and spent by crying, bring in. Now, in as low an ebb as the foot of a ladder, <laughs> and by and by, in as high a flow as the ridge of a gallows. Ah, oh, by the Lord, thou sayest true, lad. And now, is not my hostess of the tavern a most sweet wench? Is the honey of high blood. My old lad of the castle, and is not a buff jerkin a most sweet robe of durance? How oh, now, how oh, now, mad wag? What in thy quips and thy quiddities? What a plague have I to do with a buff jerkin? What a pox have I to do with my hostess of the tavern? Well, thou hast called her to a reckoning many times and oft, huh? Uh, did I ever call for thee to pay thy part? No, I'll give thee thy due. Thou hast paid all there. Yea, and elsewhere, so far as my coin would stretch, and where it would not, I've used my credit. <laughs> Yea, and so us in that, were it not here apparent that thou art heir apparent, but I prithee, sweet wag, show Oh, <laughs> uh, no, thou shalt. Shall I? Oh, rare by the Lord, I'll be a brave judge. Uh, thou judge false already. I mean, thou shalt have the hanging of thieves, and so become a rare hangman. Well, hell, well. And in some sort, it jumps with my humor as well as waiting in the court, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. For obtaining suits? Yea, for obtaining of suits. 
whereof the hangman hath no lean wardrobe. Splut, I am as melancholy as a gib cat or lugged bear. Or an old lion, or a lover's lute. Yea, or the drone of a Lancashire bagpipe. Mm. What sayest thou to a hare, or a melancholy or of Mordich? Oh, thou hast the most unsavory similes, and art indeed the most comparative, rascaliest, sweet young prince. But hell, I pray thee, trouble me no more with vanity. I would to God thou I thou and I knew where a commodity of good names were to be brought of an old lord the council raided me the other day in the street about you, sir. But I marked him not, and he talked very wisely, but I regarded him not, and yet he talked wisely, and in the street too. Well, thou dost well, for wisdom cries out in the street, no man regards it. Oh, thou hast damnable iteration, and art indeed to corrupt a saint. Thou hast done much harm upon me, Hal. God forgive thee for it. Before I knew thee, Hal, I knew nothing. And now am I a man should speak truly little better than one that the wicked I must give over the life, and I will give it over. By the Lord, and I do not, I am a villain. I'll be damned for never a king's son in Christendom. Uh, where shall we take a purse tomorrow, Jack? Zoons, where thou wilt, lad. I'll make one, and I do not call me a villain and baffle me. I see a good amendment in thy life from praying to purse taking. <laughs> Why, hell, tis my vocation, hell. Tis no sin for a man to labor in his vocation. Coins! <laughs> now God shall we know if Gadsill has set a match. Oh, if men were to be saved by merit, what hole in hell were hot enough for him? This is the most omnipotent villain that ever cried stand so, uh, to a true man. Mm, good morrow, Ned. Hey, good morrow, sweet hell. What says Monsieur Remorse, huh? What says Sir John Sack and Sugar Jack? How aggrieves the devil in thee about thy soul that thou soldest him on Good Friday last for a cup of Madeira and a cold cape on his leg? Well, Sir John <laughs> stands to his word. The devil shall have his bargain, for he was never yet a breaker of Proverbs. He will and give the devil his due. Then art thou damned for keeping thy word with the devil. <laughs> he had been damned for cousining the devil. Ah, oh, but my lads, my lads, tomorrow morning by four o'clock early, at Gadzill, there are pilgrims going to Canterbury with rich offerings and traders going to London with fat purses, huh? I have visitors for you all. You have horses for yourselves. Gadzill lies tonight in Rochester, and I have bespoke supper tomorrow night at East Chief. We may do it as secure as sleep. If you will go, I will stuff your purses full of crowns. If you will not, tarry at home and be hanged. Here he yet we're not. If I tarry at home and go not, I'll hang you for going. <laughs> you will, chaps? Ha! What? W wilt thou make one? Oh, oh. Who I, Rob? I, thief. Oh, no. Not I, by my faith. There's neither honesty, manhood, or no, nor good fellowship in thee. No, thou camps not, camps not of the blood royal if thou darest not stand for ten shillings. Well, then, once in my life I'll be a madcap. Why, that's well said. Yeah, well, come what will, I'll tarry at home. By the Lord, I'll be a traitor then, when thou art king. <laughs> I care not. Sir John, <clears throat> I prithee, leave me and the prince alone. I will lay him down such reasons for this adventure that he shall go. Oh, God give thee the spirit of persuasion and him the ears of profiting that what thou speakst may move and what he hears may be believed, that the true prince may, uh, for recreation's sake, prove a false thief, for the poor abuses of the time want countenance. Farewell. You shall find me in East Cheap. Mm, farewell, thou latter spring. Farewell, all hollow summer. Ah, uh, now. My good, sweet honey lord, ride with us tomorrow. I have a jest to execute. I cannot manage alone. Mm -hmm. Falstaff, Bardolph, Pito, and Gadzil shall rob those men that we have already waylaid. Yourself and I will not be there. And when they have the booty, if you and I do not rob them, cut this head off from my shoulders. But how shall we part from them in setting forth? Uh, why, we'll set forth before or after and uh, point them a place of meeting wherein it is at our best pleasure 
to fail. And then they will adventure upon the exploits themselves, which they shall no sooner have achieved, but we'll set upon them. Yay, but it's like they will know us by our horses, by our habits, and every other appointment to be ourselves. Not tied. Our horses they shall not see. I'll tie them up in the woods. Our wizards will change after we leave them. And Sira, I have cases of buckram for the nonce to unmask our noted outward garments. Oh, yay, but I doubt they will be too hard for us. Oh, well, for two of them, I know them to be as true bred cowards as ever turned back. And for the third, if he fight longer than he sees reason, I'll forswear arms. The virtue of this jest will be the incomprehensible lies that that same fat rogue will tell us when we meet at supper. How 30 at least he fought with, what wars, what blows, what extremities he endured. And in the reproof of this lies the jest. Ah, well... I'll go with thee. Provide us all things necessary and meet me tomorrow night in East Cheap. There I'll stop. Farewell. Farewell, my lord. I know you all. And will a while uphold the unyoked humor of your idleness. Yet... Herein, I will imitate the sun, who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world that when he pleased to be himself again, being wanted, he may be more wondered at by breaking through the foul and ugly mists of vapors that did seem to strangle him. If all the year were playing holidays, To sport would be as tedious as to work, but when they seldom come, the wished for come. And nothing pleases but rare accident. So, when this loose behavior I throw off and pay the debt I never promised by how much better than my word I am, by so much shall I falsify men's hopes like a bright metal on a sullen ground, my reformation glittering o'er my fault shall show more goodly and attract more eyes than that which hath no foil to set it off. I'll so offend to make offense a skill. Redeeming time, when men think least I will, My blood hath been too cold and temperate, unapt to stir at these indignities, and you have found me, for accordingly you tread upon my patience. But be sure I will from henceforth rather be myself, mighty and to be feared than my condition which hath been smooth as oil, soft as young down, and therefore lost that title of respect which the proud soul ne'er pays but to the proud. Our house, my sovereign liege, little deserves the scourge of greatness to be used on it, and that same greatness to which our hands have helped to make so portly. My lord. Worcester, get thee gone, for I do see danger and disobedience in thine eye. (laughs) Sir, your presence is too bold and peremptory. And majesty might never yet endure the moody frontier of a servant brow. You have good leave to leave us. When we need your use and counsel, we shall send for you. You were about to speak? Yea, my good lord. Those prisoners in your highness name demanded, which Harry Percy here at Holmden took, were, as he says, not with such strength denied as is delivered to your majesty. Either envy, therefore, or Miss Prisian is guilty of this fault, and not my son. My liege, I did deny no prisoners. But I remember when the fight was done, when I was dry with rage and extreme toil, breathless and faint, leaning upon my sword, came there a certain lord, neat, 
and trimly dressed, fresh as a bridegroom and his chin new reaped, showed like a stubble land at harvest home. He was perfumed like a milliner, and twixt his finger and his thumb he held a poncet box, which ever and anon he gave his nose and took away again, who therewith angry when it next came there, took it in snuff, and still he smiled and talked, and as the soldiers bore dead bodies by, he called them untaught knaves, unmannerly, to bring a slovenly, unhandsome course betwixt the wind and his nobility. With many holiday and lady terms, he questioned me, amongst the rest demanded my prisoners in your majesty's behalf. I then, all smarting, with my wounds being called to be so pestered with a popinjay, out of my grief and my impatience answered neglectingly, I know not what. He, sh he should or he should not, for he made me mad to see him shine so brisk and smell so sweet and talk so like a waiting gentlewoman of guns and drums and wounds. God save the mark! And telling me the sovereignest thing on earth was parsimity for an inward bruise, and that it was great pity, so it was, the villainous saltpeter should be digged out of the bowels of the harmless earth, which many a good tall fellow hath destroyed so cowardly, and but for these vile guns, he would himself have been a soldier. This bald, unjointed chat of his, my lord, I answered indirectly as I said, and I beseech you, let not his report come current for an accusation betwixt my love and your majesty. The circumstance considered, good my lord, whate'er Lord Harry Percy then had said to such a person and in such a place at such a time, and with all the rest retold may reasonably die and never rise to do him wrong or any way impeach what then he said, so he unsay it now. <laughs> Why, yet he, he doth deny his prisoners, but with proviso and exception that we at our own charge shall ransom straight his brother-in-law, the foolish Mortimer, who <laughs> on my soul hath willfully betrayed the lives of those that he did lead to fight against that great magician, damned Glendower, whose daughter, as we hear, that Earl of March hath lately married. Shall our coffers then be emptied to redeem a traitor home? Shall we buy treason and indent with fears when they have lost and forfeited themselves? No, on the barren mountains, let him starve. For I shall never hold that man my friend whose tongue shall ask me for one penny cost to ransom home revolted Mortimer. Revolted Mortimer! He never did fall off my sovereign liege, but by the chance of war to prove that true needs no more but one tongue for all these wounds, those mouthed wounds, which he valiantly he took. When on the gentle severance said ye bank in single opposition hand to hand, he did confound the best part of an hour in changing hardiment with great Glendower. Three times they breathed and three times did they drink upon aggrievement of swift severance flood who then affrighted with their bloody looks, ran fearfully among the trembling reeds and hid his crisp head in the hollow bank, bloodstained with these valiant combatants. Never did base and rotten policy color her working with such deadly wounds, nor never could the noble Mortimer receive so many and all willingly. Then let not him be slandered with revolt. Thou dost belie him, Percy. Thou dost belie him. He never did encounter with Glendower. I tell thee, he durst as well have met the devil alone as Owen Glendower for an enemy. Art thou not ashamed? But, sirrah, henceforth, let me not hear you speak of Mortimer. Send me your prisoners with the speediest means. 
or you shall hear in such a kind from me as will displease you. My Lord Northumberland, we license your departure with your son. Send us your prisoners, or you will hear of it. And if the devil come and roar for them, I will not send them! Oh, I will after straight and tell him so, for I will ease my heart, albeit I make a hazard of my head. What, drunk with collar? Stay and pause a while. Here comes your uncle. Speak of Mortimer. Zounds, I will speak of him. And let my soul want mercy if I do not join with him. Yea, on his part, I'll empty all these veins and shed my dear blood drop by drop in the dust. But I will lift the downtrod Mortimer as high in the air as this unthankful king, as this ingrate and cankered bullet brook. Brother, the king hath made your nephew mad. Who struck this heat up after I was gone? He will, forsooth, have all my prisoners. And when I urge the ransom once again of my wife's brother, then his cheek looked pale. And on my face he turned an eye of death, trembling even at the name of Mortimer. <laughs> I cannot blame him. Was not he proclaimed by Richard that dead is the next of blood? He was. I heard the proclamation. And then it was when the unhappy king, whose wrongs in us God pardon, did set forth upon his Irish expedition. From whence he intercepted, did return to be deposed and shortly <laughs> murdered. And for whose death we in the world's wide mouth live scandalized and foully spoken of? But soft, I pray you, did King Richard then proclaim my brother Edmund Mortimer heir to crown? He did, myself did hear it. Nay. And I cannot blame his cousin king that wished him on the barren mountain starve. But shall it be that you, that set the crown upon the head of this forgetful man, and for his sake wear the detested blot of murderous subornation, shall it be that you, a world of curses, undergo being the agents or base second means, the cords, the, the ladder, or the hangman's rather? <sighs> Pardon me that I descend so low to show the line and the predicament wherein you range under this subtle king. Shall it for shame be spoken in these days or fill up chronicles in time to come that men of your nobility and power did gauge them both in an unjust behalf as both of you, God pardon it, have done? To put down Richard, that sweet, lovely rose, and plant this thorn, this canker bowling brook, and shall it in more shame be further spoken of that you were fooled, discarded, and shook off by him for whom these shames you underwent? No. <laughs> Yet time serves wherein you may redeem your banished honors and restore yourselves into the good thoughts of the, the world again. Revenge the jeering and disdained contempt of this proud king who studies day and night to answer all the debt he owes to you, even with the bloody payment of your death. Therefore, I say, Please, cousin, say no more. And now, I will unclasp a secret book. And to your quick conceiving discontents, I'll read you matter deep and dangerous, as full of peril and adventurous spirit as to your walk, a current roaring loud on the unsteadfast footing of a spear. If he fall in, good night or sink or swim. Send <laughs> danger from the east and to the west. So honor cross it from the north to the south and let him grapple. Oh! <laughs> The blood more stirs to rouse a lion than to start a hare. Imagination of some great exploit drives him beyond the bounds of patience. By heaven, methinks it were an easy leap to pluck bright honor from the pale-faced moon or dive into the bottom of the deep where fathom line could never touch the ground and pluck up drowned honor by the locks. So he that doth redeem her thence might wear without corrival all her dignities, but out upon this half-faced fellowship. 
He apprehends a world of figures here, but not the form of what he should attend. <clears throat> Good cousin, give me audience for a while. I cry your mercy. <sighs> Those same noble Scots that are your prisoners. I'll keep them all. By God, he shall not have a Scot of them, no. If a Scot would save his soul, he shall not. I'll keep him by this hand. You start away and lend no ear unto my purposes. Those prisoners you shall keep. Nay, hey, I will. That's flat. He said he would not ransom Mortimer, forbade my tongue to speak of Mortimer. But I'll find him where he lies asleep, and in his ear I'll holla. Mortimer! <laughs> Nay, I'll have a starling shall be taught to speak nothing but Mortimer and give it to him to keep his anger still in motion. Hear you, cousin, a word. All studies here I solemnly defy, save how to gall and pinch this bullying brook and that same sword and buckler, Prince of Wales, but that I think his father loves him not and would be glad he met with some mischance I would have poisoned with a pot of ale. Farewell, kinsman. I'll talk to you when you're better tempered to attend. Ay, what a wasp stung and impatient fool art thou to break into this woman's mood, tying thine ear to no tongue but thine own. I look you. I am whipped and scourged with rods, nettled and stung with pismires when I hear of this vile politician, Bolingbroke. In Richard's time, what do you call the place? plague on it. It was in Gloucestershire. Twas where the madcap duke his uncle kept, his uncle York, where I first bowed my knee unto the king of smiles, this Bolingbroke. Spud! When you and he came back from Ravensburg. At Barclay Castle. You say true. <laughs> Why? What a candy deal of courtesy this fawning greyhound then did proffer me. Look, when his infant fortune came to age, and gentle Harry Percy, and kind cousin... Oh, the devil takes such cousiners! God forgive me! Good uncle, tell your tale. I've done. Nay, if you have not to it again, we will stay your leisure. Oh, I've done, faith. Then... Once more to your Scottish prisoners, deliver them up without their ransom straight, and make the Douglas son your only mean for powers in Scotland, which, for diverse reasons which I shall send you written, be assured, will easily be granted. You, my lord, your son in Scotland, being thus employed, shall secretly into the bosom creep of that same noble prelate, well beloved, the Archbishop. Of York, is it not? True who bears hard his brother's death at Bristow the Lord's Scroop. I speak not this in estimation, as what I think might be, but what I know is ruminated, plotted, and set down, and only stays but to behold the face of that occasion that shall bring it on. I smell it upon my life. It will do well. Before the game is afoot, thou shalt let's slip. Why? It cannot choose but be a noble plot, and then the power of Scotland and of York to join with Mortimer, huh? And so they shall. Oh, in faith, it is exceedingly well aimed. And tis no little reason bids the speed to save our heads by raising of a head. For bear ourselves as even as we can. The king will always think him in our debt. And think we think ourselves unsatisfied till he hath found a time to pay us home and see already how he doth begin to make us strangers to his looks of love. He does. He does. We'll be revenged on him. Cousin, farewell. No further go on this than I by letter shall direct your course. When time is ripe, which will be suddenly, I'll steal to Glendower and Lord Mortimer, where you and Douglas and our powers at once, as I will fashion it, shall haply meet to bear our fortunes in our own strong arms, which now we hold at much uncertainty. <laughs> Farewell, good brother. We shall thrive, I trust. Uncle, adieu. Oh. Let the hours be short till fields and blows and groans applaud our sport.
Hi ho. And it be not for by the day I'll be hanged. Charles Wayne is o'er there by the new chimney, and yet our horse is not packed. What ostler? Anon. Anon. Oh, I prithee, Tom, beat cut saddle, put a few flocks in the point. Poor Jade is wrung in the withers out of all cess. Oh, peas and beans are as dank here as a dog, and that is the next way to give poor Jade's the bots. This house has turned upside down since Robin Ostler died. Oh, the poor fellow never joyed since the price of oats rose. It was the death of him. I think this be the most villainous house in all London Road for fleas. I am stung like a tench. <laughs> like a tench. <laughs> By the mass, there's ne'er a king christened could be better bit than I have been since the first cock. <laughs> Why, they will allow us ne'er a Jordan than we leak in your chimney and your chamber lie breeds fleas like a loach. Oh, what ostler? Come away and be hanged. Come away. I have a gammon of bacon and two raisins of ginger to be delivered as far as Charing Cross. God's body, the turkeys in my pannier are quite starved. <sighs> what ostler? Oh, plague on thee. Hast thou never an eye in thy head? Canst not hear? And twere not as good deed as drink to break the pate on thee, I am the very villain. Come and be hanged. Hast no faith in thee? Tomorrow, carriers, what's o'clock? Why, I think it be two o'clock. I prithee, lend me thy lantern to see my gelding in the stable. <laughs> Nay, <laughs> by God soft, I know a trick worth two of that in faith. Well, I pray thee, lend me thine. Hey, when canst tell, lend me thy lantern, quoth thee. Mary, I'll see thee hang first. <clears throat> Sarah Carrier, what time do you mean to come to London? Time enough to go to bed with a candle, I warrant thee. Come, neighbor Muggs, we'll call up the gentlemen. They will along with company, for they have great charge. What ho, Chamberlain? At hand, quoth Pickpurse. Ah, that's even as fair as at hand, quoth the Chamberlain. For thou variest no more from picking up purses than giving direction doth from laboring. Thou layest the plot how? Good morrow, Master Gadshall. It holds current that I told you yesternight there is a Franklin in the wild of Kent hath brought three hundred marks with him in gold. I heard him tell it to one of his company last night at supper, a kind of auditor, a one that hath abundance of charge to God knows what. They are up already and call for eggs and butter. They will away presently. Sirrah, if they meet not with St. Nicholas Clark's, I'll give thee this neck. <laughs> no, I'll none of it. I pray thee, keep that for the hangman, for I know thou worshipest St. Nicholas as truly as a man of falsehood may. Why talkst thou to me of the hangman? If I hang, I'll make a fat pair of gallows, for if I hang, old Sir John hangs with me, and thou knowest he is no starveling. Tut! There are other Troyans that thou dreamst not of, the which, for sport's sake, are content to do the profession some grace that would, if matters should be looked into, for their own credit's sake, make all whole. I am joined with no footland rakers, no longstaff sixpenny strikers, none of those mad mustachio purple-hued malt worms, but with the nobility and tranquility, burgomasters, and great one years, such as can hold in, such as will strike sooner than speak, and speak sooner than drink, and drink sooner than pray. And yet, ha, zoons, I lie, for they pray continually to their saint, the commonwealth, or rather, not pray to her, but pray on her, for they ride up and down on her and make her their boots. <laughs> what, the commonwealth their boots? Oh, will she hold out water and foul play? Ah, she will, she will. Justice hath liquored her. We steal as in a castle, cocksure. We have the receipt of fern seed. We walk invisible. Nay, by my faith. 
I think you are more beholding to the night than to fern seed for your walking invisible. <laughs> Give me thy hand. Thou shall have a share in our purse as I am a true man. <laughs> Nay, rather, let me have it as you are a false thief. Go to. Homo is a common name to all men. Huh. Bid the ostler bring my gelding out of the stable. Farewell, you muddy knave. <laughs> Come, come, shelter, shelter. I have removed Falstaff's horse and he frets like gummed velvet. Oh, sit down close. Poins, poins, oh, be hanged, poins. Oh, peace, ye fat kidneyed rascal. What a brawling dost thou keep. Where's poins, Hal? He has walked up to the top of the hill. I'll go seek him. I am accursed to rob in that thieves' company. The rascal hath removed my horse and tied him, I, I know not where. If I travel but four foot by the squire further afoot, I shall break my wind. Well, I doubt not, doubt not but to die a fair death for all this if I escape hanging for killing that rogue. I have forsworn his company hourly any time this two and twenty years. And I am, yet I am bewitched with that rogue's company. If the rascal have not given me medicines to make me love him, I'll be hanged. If I could not be else, I have drunk medicines. Poins! Hal! A plague upon you both. Bardolph! Uh, Pedo! I'll starve ere I rob a foot further. And twere not as good a deed as drink to turn a true man to leave these rogues. I am the veriest varlet that ever chewed with a tooth. Eight yards, yards of uneven ground is three score and ten miles a foot with me. And the stony hearted villains know it well enough. A plague upon it when thieves cannot be true to one another. Who? <whistles> Oh, plague upon you all. Give me my horse, you rogues. Give me my horse and be hanged. <laughs> Peace, ye fat guts. Lie down. Lie thine ear close to the ground and list if thou canst hear the tread of travelers. <laughs> Have you any levers to lift me up again being down? <laughs> God, I'll not bear my own flesh so far afoot again for all the queen in thy father's exchequer. What a plague means ye to colt me thus? Thou liest. Thou art not colted. Thou art uncolted. I pray thee, good Prince Hal, help me to my horse, good king's son. Oh, out ye rogue! Shall I be your ostler? Hang thyself and thine own heir apparent garters if I be if I be ta'en a, a peach for this. And I have not ballads made on you all and sung to and I have not ballads made on you all and sung to filthy tunes. Uh, let a caps, cup of sack be my poison. When a jest is so forward and a foot too, I hate it. Stand. So I do against my will. Oh, tis our oh, settler. Tis my I know settler I know his voice. What news? Casey, Casey, on with your wizards. There's money of the kings coming down the hill. Tis going to the king's exchequer. You lie, you rogue, tis going to, going to the king's tavern. There's enough to make us all. To be hanged. Uh, sirs, you four shall front them in the narrow lane. Ned Poins and I will walk the lower. If they escape from your encounter, then they light on us. Well, how many be there of them? Uh, some eight or ten. Zunes, will they not rob us? Oh, what a coward, Sir John Ponch. Uh, well, I, indeed, I am not John of Gaunt, her grandfather. But yet no coward, Hal. Well, we'll leave that to the proof. Ah, Sirrah Jack, thy horse stands behind the hedge. When thou needest him, there thou shalt find him. Farewell, and stand fast. Now can I strike him if I should be hanged? Oh, Ned, where are our disguises? Shh. Here, hard by, stand close. Now, my masters. Happy man be his dole, say I, every man to his business. <clears throat> Come, neighbor, the boy shall lead our horses down the hill. We'll walk afoot a while and ease our legs. 
And, 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 <laughs> Jesus, right. Jesus. Now with them, put the villain's throats. Ah, oh, horse and caterpillars, bacon fed knaves. They hate us, youth. Down with them, fleece them. Oh, we are undone, both we and ours forever. Hang ye, gore bellied knaves, are ye undone? No, ye fat shelves, I would your store were here. On bacon's on. What ye knaves, young men, must live. You are grandeurs, are you? Well, will jur ye faith. <laughs> <laughs> the thieves have found the true men. And now, could thou and rob the thieves and go merrily to London? It would be an argument for a week, laughter for a month, and a good jest forever. Oh, stand close, I hear them coming. Come, my masters, let us share and then to horse before day, and the prince and poins be two errant cowards. There is no equity stirring, there is no more valor, valor in that poins than in a wild duck. Your money! Finish! Oh, oh, no! Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> God with much ease! <laughs> Now, merrily to horse, the thieves are all scattered and possessed with fear so strange strongly that they dare not meet each other. Each <laughs> takes his fellow for an officer. <laughs> Away, good net! Falstaff sweats to death and lords the lean earth as he walks along. <laughs> Were it not for laughing, I should pity him. Get out, fat rogue lord! <laughs> But for my own part, my lord, I could be well contented to be there in the respect of the love I bear your house. He could be contented. Why is he not then? In the respect of the love he bears our house. He shows in this he loves his own barn better than he loves our house. Let me see some more. The purpose you undertake is dangerous. Pfft, that's certain. It is dangerous to take a cold, to sleep, to drink. But I tell you, my lord fool, out of this nettle danger, we pluck this flower safety. The purpose you undertake is dangerous, the friends you have named uncertain, the time itself unsorted, and your whole plot too light for the counterpoise of so great an opposition. Say you so. Hmm. Say you so. Well, I say unto you again, you are a shallow, cowardly hind, and you lie. What a lack brain is this? By the Lord, our plot is as good a plot as ever was laid. Our friends, true and constant, a good plot, good friends, and full of expectation, an excellent plot, very good friends. What a frosty spirited rogue is this? Why, my Lord of York commends the plot and the general course of the action. Zooms, and I were now by this rascal, I could brain him with his lady's fan. Is there not my father, my uncle, and myself, Lord Edmund Mortimer, my Lord of York and Owen Glendower? Is there not besides the Douglas? Have I not all their letters to meet me in the arms by the ninth of next month? And are they not some of them set forward already? What a pagan rascal is this, huh? An infidel! Huh? You shall see now in very sincerity of fear and cold heart will he to the king and lay open all our proceedings. Oh, I could divide myself and go to buffets for moving such a dish of skim milk with so honorable an action. Hang him! Let him tell the king we're prepared and I will set forward tonight. How oh, now, Kate? I must leave you within these two hours. Oh my good Lord, why are you thus alone? For what offense have I this fortnight been a banished woman from my Harry's bed? Tell me, sweet Lord, what is that takes thee from thy stomach, pleasure, and thy golden sleep? Why dost thou bend thine eyes upon the earth and start so often when thou sitst alone? Why hast thou lost the fresh blood in thy cheeks and given my treasures and my rights of thee to the thick-eyed musing and cursed melancholy? 
In thy faint slumbers, I by thee have watched and heard thee murmur tales of iron wars. Speak terms of manage to thy bounding steed, cry courage to the field, and thou hast talked of sallies and retires, of trenches, tents, of palisados, frontiers, parapets, of basilisks, of cannon, culverin, of prisoners ransom, and of soldiers slain, and all the currents of a heady fight. Thy spirit within thee hath been so at war, and thus hath so bestirred thee in thy sleep that beads of sweat have stood upon thy brow like bubbles in a late disturbed stream. And in thy face strange motions have appeared, such as we see when men restrain their breath on some great sudden hest. What portents are these? Some heavy business hath my lord in hand, and I must know it, else he loves me not. What ho? Is Gilliams with the packet gone? Uh, he is, my lord, an hour ago. Hath Butler brought those horses from the sheriff? Uh, one horse, my lord, he brought even now. What horse? Roan? Or crop-eared, is it not? Uh, it is, my lord. That roan shall be my throne. Well, I will, I will back him straight. Oh, Esperance. Did Butler lead him forth into the park? But hear you, my lord. What sayst thou, my lady? What is it carries you away? Why, my horse, my love, my horse. How, oh, you mad-headed ape! A weasel hath not such a deal of spleen as you are tossed with. In faith, I'll know your business, Harry, that I will. I fear my brother Mortimer doth stir about his title and hath sent for you to line his enterprise. But if you go... Go far afoot, I shall be weary, love. Come, come, you paraquito, answer me directly unto this question that I ask. In faith, I'll break thy little finger, Harry, and if thou wilt not tell me all things true. Away! Away, you trifler. Love. I love thee not. I care not for thee, Kate. This is no world to play with mammoths and to tilt with lips. We must have bloody noses and cracked crowns and pass them current too. God's me, my horse! What sayst thou, Kate? What wouldst thou have with me? Do you not love me? Do you not indeed? Well, do not then, for since you love me not, I will not love myself. Do you not love me? Nay, tell me if you speak in jest or no. Wilt thou see me ride? And when I am a horseback, I will swear I love thee infinitely. But hark you, Kate, I must not have you henceforth question me whither I go. No reason whereabout. Whither I must, I must. And to conclude, this evening must I leave you, gentle Kate. I know you wise, but yet no farther wise than Harry Percy's wife. Constant you are but yet a woman, and for secrecy, no lady closer. For I well believe thou wilt not utter what thou dost not know, and so far will I trust thee, gentle Kate. How? Oh, so far? Not an inch further. But hark you, Kate. Whither I go, thither shall you go too. Today I will set forth, tomorrow you. Will this content you, Kate? It must of force. <laughs> Ned, prithee, come out of that fat room and lend me thy hand to laugh a little. Where hast thou been, Al? With three or four loggerheads amongst three <laughs> or four score hogsheads, I have sounded the very base string of humility. Sirrah, I am a sworn brother to a lease of drawers, and I can call them all by their Christian names as, um, Tom, Dick, <laughs> and Francis! Francis! <laughs> they take it already upon their salvation and thought I be, and though I be but Prince of Wales, yet I am the king of courtesy. And tell me flatly that I am no proud Jack like Falstaff, but a Corinthian, a, a lad of metal, a good boy by the Lord, so they call me. And when I am king of England, I shall command all the good lads in his sheep, 
They ah. call them drinking deep, dying scarlet. And when you breathe in your watering, they cry <clears throat> and bid you to play it off. To conclude, I am so good a proficient in one quarter of an hour that I can drink with any tinker in his own, la in his own language during my life. I tell thee, Ned, thou hast lost much honor that thou wert not with me in this action. But, sweet Ned, mm. to sweeten which name of Ned, <laughs> I give thee this uh, penny worth of sugar, clapped even now in my hand by an undersinker, one that never spake other, uh, other English in his life than eight shillings and six pence, and you are welcome with <laughs> this, this shrill addition. A non a non, sir, a score a pint of bastard in the half moon, or, or, or so. But Ned, mm. to drive away the time till Falstaff come, I pray thee do thou stand in some by room, while I question my puny drawer to what end I, he gave me the sugar, and do thou never leave calling Francis <laughs> till his tale to me be nothing but a non. <laughs> Oh, step, step aside. I'll show thee uh, a present. Francis! <laughs> oh, perfect! Francis! On and on, sir. Look down into the pomegranate wealth. Uh, uh, come, come here there, Francis. My lord. How long hast thou to serve, Francis? Uh, forsooth, five years and as much as two. Francis! Anon, anon, sir. Five years, by our lady. A long lease for the clinking of pewter. But, yeah. Francis, dost thou be so valiant as to play the coward with thy indenture and show off a pair of heels and run from it? Oh, Lord, sir. I'll be sworn upon all the books in England if I could find my heart. Non serious? A non sir. How old art thou, Francis? Let me see. Uh, about Michael Miss next, I shall be. Serious? A non sir. Pray stay a little while, my lord. Nay, uh, but but hark you, Francis, for the sugar thou gavest me. Was it a pennyworth? Was not? Oh Lord, I would it had been too. <laughs> I will give thee for it a thousand pound. Ask me when thou wilt, and thou shalt have it. Francis! A nun! A nun! <laughs> a nun, Francis? No, Francis, but tomorrow, Francis. Or Francis a Thursday, or indeed Francis when thou wilt, but Francis. My lord? But wilt thou rob this leather jerkin, crystal button, not pated, agate ring, puke stocking, caitus garter, smooth tongue, Spanish uh, pouch? Lord, sir, who do you mean? Why then, your brown bastard is your only drink. For look you, Francis, your white canvas doub doublet will sully. In Barbary, sir, it cannot come to so much. What, sir? Francis! Away, you rogue! Dost thou not hear him call? What? Stands thou still and hear such calling? Look to the guests within. Oh, God. Old Sir John with half a dozen more at the door. Shall I let them in? Mm. I'll let them alone a while and then, and then open the door. <clears throat> Points! Here, Falstaff and the rest of the thieves are at the door. Shall we be merry? You are as merry as crickets, my lad. <laughs> but hark ye, what cunning match have you made with this jest of the drawer? Come, what's the issue? Oh, I am now of all humors that have showed themselves humors since the old days of Goodman Adam to the pupil age of this present twelve o'clock at midnight. <laughs> what's a clock, Francis? Oh, Whatever the 
shall not fellow should have fewer words than a parrot, and yet the son of a woman? His industry is upstairs and downstairs, his eloquence the parcel of a reckoning. I am not yet of Percy's mind, the hot spur of the north. He that kills me six or seven dozen Scots at breakfast washes his hand and says to his wife, Fie upon a quiet life, I want work. Oh, my sweet Harry, she says, <laughs> how many hast thou killed today? Give my roan horse a drench, he says, and answers, <clears throat> some fourteen. An hour after, a trifle, a trifle. <laughs> Oh, I, I, I prithee, call in Falstaff. I'll play Percy, and that damned brawn shall play Dame Mortimer, his wife. Revo, says the drunkard. Call in ribs. Call in. Oh, welcome, Ow. Jack. Jack, <laughs> where hast thou been? Plague of all cowards, I say, in vengeance, too. Marry and amen. Give me a cup of sack, boy. Ere I lead this long life, I'll sow nether stocks and mend them and foot them too. A plague of all cowards. Give me a cup of sack, rogue. Is there no virtue extent? Didst <sighs> thou ever see a titan kiss a dish of butter? Pitiful hearted titan that melted at a sweet tail of the sun. Didst, if thou didst, then behold that compound. You rogue, here's lime in that sack too. There is nothing but roguery to be found in a villainous man. Yet a coward is worse than a cup of sack with lime in it. A villainous coward. Go thy ways, old Jack. Die when thou wilt of manhood. Good manhood be not forgot upon the face of the earth. Then am I a shoddering hair, shot and herring. There lives not the three good men unhanged in England. And one of them is fat and grows old. God help the wild. A bad world, I say. I would I were a weaver. I could sing songs or anything. A plague of all cowards, I say still. Oh, how now, Woolsack? What matter you? A king's son? If I do not beat thee out of thy kingdom with a dagger of lath and drive all thy subjects afore thee like a flock of wild geese, I'll never wear hair on my face more, you, you prince of Wales. Why, you horse and round man, what's the matter? Are not you a coward? Answer me that. Poins there. Oh, ho, ho. zoons ye, fat punch. And ye call me a coward. By the Lord, I'll stab thee. I call thee coward. I'll see thee damned ere I call thee coward. But I would give a thousand pound I could run as fast as thou canst. You are straight enough in the shoulders. You care not who sees your back. Call you that backing of your friends? A plague upon such backing. Give me them that will face me. Give me a cup of sack. I am a rogue I, if I drunk today. Oh, villain. Thy lips are scarce wiped since thou hast drunken last. I was one for that. A plague of all cowards still, I say. Mm. What's the matter? What's the matter? There be four of us here have taken a thousand pound this day morning. Where is it, Jack? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, taken from us it is. A hundred upon poor four of us. What, a hundred man? Well, I am a rogue if I were not at half sword with a dozen of them two hours together. I have escaped by miracle. Mm -hmm. I am eight times thrust through the doublet. Four through the hose, my buckler cut through and through, my, my sword hacked like a handsaw, ecchi signum. I never dealt better since I was a man and would not do. A plague of all cowards. Let them speak. If they speak more or less the truth, they are villains and the sons of darkness. Mm. Uh, uh, speak, sirs. How was it? Uh, we four set upon some dozen. Sixteen at the least, my lord. And bound them. No, no, they were not bound. You rode, they were bound, every man of them. And uh, as we were sharing, some six or seven freshmen set upon us. Uh, and unbound the rest and then come in the other. But uh, fought, fought you with them all? All? I know not what you call all, but if I fought not with 50 of them, I am a bunch of radish. If there were not two or three and 50 upon poor old Jack... 
then am I no two-legged creature? Well, pray God you have not murdered some of them. Oh, nay. That's past praying for. I have peppered two of them. Two, I am sure, have paid uh, two rogues in buckram suits. I tell thee what had. Hell, if I tell thee a lie, spit in my face and call me horse. Thou knowest my old war here. I, I, I lie, lay, and thus I bore my point. Four rogues in buckram drive at me. What? For, four? Mm, thou saidst but two, even now. Uh, four, hell, I, I told thee four. Aye, aye, you said four. These four came all affront and mainly thrust at me. I made no more ado, but took all their seven points in my target thus. Seven? Uh, why, there were but four even now. In Buckram? Aye, four in Buckram suits. Uh, seven by these hilts, or I am a villain else. Now, prithee, let him alone. We shall have more now. Uh, dost thou hear me, Hal? Aye, and mark thee too, Jack. Uh, do so, for it is worth the listing to. These nine in Buckram that I've told thee of. So the two more uh, already. <laughs> their points being broken. Uh, began to give me ground, but I follow me close. I came in foot and hand, and with a thought, seven of the eleven I paid. Oh, monstrous. Eleven Buckram men grown out of two. But as the devil would have it, three misbegotten knaves in Kendall Green came at my back and let drive at me, uh, for it was so dark, hell, that thou couldst not see thy hand. Oh, these lies are like their father that begets them. Gross as a mountain, open, palpable. Why, thou clay-brained guts, thou naughty-pated fool, thou... Horson, obscene, greasy, tallow cat. What, art thou mad? Art thou mad? Is not the truth the truth? What? How couldst thou not, how couldst thou know these men were in Kendall Green when it was so dark thou couldst not see thy hand? Oh, come, tell us your reason. What sayest thou to this? Come, your reason, Jack, your reason. Uh, what, upon compulsion? Zunes and I were at the strapado, or all the racks in the world I would not tell you on compulsion. Give you a reason on compulsion? If reason were as plentiful as blackberries, I would give no man a reason upon compulsion, I. I'll no longer be guilty of this sin. This sanguine coward, this bed presser, this horseback breaker, this huge hill of Flesh. Blood, you starveling, you eel skin, you dried neat's tongue, you bull's pizzle, you stockfish. Oh, for breath to utter what it is like thee. You, you, you tailor's yard, you sheath, you bow case, you vile standing tuck. Well, breathe a while and then to it again. And when thou hast tried <coughs> thyself in base comparisons, hear me speak but this. Mark, Jack. <clears throat> we too. <coughs> Saw you four, set on four, and bound them and were masters of their wealth. <laughs> oh, Mark, how a plain tale shall put you down. <laughs> then did we two set on you four, and with a word outfaced you from your prize, and have it, yea, and can show it you here in the house. <laughs> and false death, you carried away your guts away as nimbly with his quick dexterity and roared for mercy and still run and roared as ever I heard a bull calf. <laughs> what a slave art thou to have hacked thy sword as thou hast done and say it was in a fight. What trick, what device, what starting hole canst thou now find to hide thee from this open and apparent shame? Come, let's hear Jack. What trick hast thou now, huh? Uh, uh. <laughs> By the Lord, I knew he as well as he that made me. <laughs> My masters, was it for me to kill the heir apparent? Should I turn upon the true prince? <laughs> Why thou knowest I am as valiant as Hercules. But beware instinct. The lion will the lion will not touch the true prince. Instinct is a great matter. I was not now a coward on instinct. I shall think the better of myself and thee during my life. I, for a valiant lion, and 
thou for a true prince. But by the Lord, lads, I am glad you have the money. <laughs> Hostess, clap the doors. Watch tonight. Pray tomorrow. Gallants, lads, boys, hearts of gold, all the titles of good fellowship come to you. What? Shall we be merry? Shall we have a play extempore? Oh, content. And the argument shall be thy running away. Ah, no, no more of that hell as thou lovest me. Jesu, my lord the prince. Oh, how now, my lady hostess? What sayest thou to be? <laughs> Mary, my lord, there is a nobleman of the court at door would speak with you. He says he comes from your father. Give him as much as will make him a royal man and send him back to my mother. Oh, what manner of man is he? An old man. What doth gravity out of his bed at midnight? Shall I give him his answer? Yeah, prithee do, Jack. Well, Faith, then I'll send him packing. <sighs> now, sirs, by Our Lady, you fought fair. So did you, Peter. So did you, Bardolph. You are lions, too. You ran away upon instinct. You will not tr touch the true prince, no fie. Faith, I ran when I saw the others run. Ah, oh, Faith! Uh, tell me now, in earnest, how came Falstaff's sword so hacked? What? He hacked it with his dagger <laughs> and said he would swear truth out of England, but he would make you believe it was done in fight and persuaded us to do the like. Yea, and to tickle our noses with spear grass to make them bleed and then to beslubber our garments with it and swear it was the blood of true men. <laughs> I did that, I did not this seven years before. I I blushed to hear his monstrous device. <laughs> oh, villain. Thou stolest the cup of sack 18 years ago and wert taken by the manor, and ever since thou hast blushed extempore. Uh, thou hadst fire and sword on thy side, and yet thou ranst away. What instinct hadst thou for it? My lord, do you see these meteors? Mm. Do you behold these exhalations? Mm -hmm. I do. What think you they pretend? Mm. Hot livers and cold purses. Collar, my lord, if rightly taken. Oh, uh, no, if rightly taken, Halter. Ah, here comes lean Jack. Here comes bare bones. How now, my sweet creature of bombast? How long is to Jack since thou sawst thine own knee? Mine own knee? Well, when I was about thy years, Hal, I was not an eagle's talent in the waist. I could have crept into any old alderman's thumb ring. A plague of sighing and grief, it blows a man up like a bladder. There's, there's villainous news abroad. Here was Sir he John Bracy from your father. You must to the court in the morning. That same mad fellow of the north, Percy and he of Wales that gave Amon Mon uh, the Bastido and made Lucifer cuckold and swore the devil is true liegeman upon the cross of a Welsh hook. What a plague call you him. Uh, oh, Glendower. Owen. Owen the same. And his son-in-law, Mortimer, an old Northumberland and the sprightly sprite of Scots, Douglas, that runs a horse back up a hill perpendicular. He that rides at high speeds and with his pistol kills a sparrow flying. You have hit it. So did he never hit the sparrow. Well, that rascal hath good metal in him. He will not run. Why, what a rascal art thou then to praise him so for running? A horseback, ye cuckoo. But a foot he will not, he will not budge a foot. Yes, Jack, upon instinct. I grant you, upon instinct. Well, he is there too, and one more drake, and a thousand blue caps more. Worcester is stolen away tonight. Thy father's beard is turned white with the news. You may buy land now as cheap as stinking mackerel. Why then, if it is like, if there come a hot June in this civil buffeting hold, we shall buy maiden heads as they buy hob nails by the hundreds. By the mass, lad, thou sayest true. It is like we shall have good trading that way. But hell, tell me, Hal, art not thou horrible afeard? Thou being heir apparent, could the world pick thee out of three such enemies again as the fiend Douglas, the spirit Percy, and that devil Glendower? 
Art thou not horribly afraid? Doth not thy blood thrill at it? Mm, not a whit. In faith, I lack some of thy instinct. <laughs> thou wilt be horribly chide tomorrow when thou comes to thy father. If thou lovest me, practice an answer. Do thou stand for my father and examine me upon the particulars of my life? <laughs> shall I? Content. This chair shall be my state. Uh, this dagger my scepter and this cushion my crown. Uh. Mm, thy state is taken for a joint stool, thy golden scepter for a leaden dagger, and thy precious rich crown for a pitiful bald one. <laughs> Well, and the fire of grace be not quite out of thee, now shalt thou be moved. Give me a cup of sack to make my eyes look red, that it may be thought I have wept, for I speak not in passion, and I will do it in King Cambius's vein. Well, here is my leg. And here is my speech. Stand aside, nobility. Oh, Jesus, this is excellent sport than faith. <laughs> Weep not, sweet queen. For trickling tears are vain. No, oh, the father, how he holds his countenance. For God's sakes, lords, convey my tristful queen, for tears do stop the floodgates of her eyes. Oh, Jesus, he doth it as like one of those harlotry players as ever I see. <laughs> peace, good pine pot, peace. Good tickle brain. Harry, I do not only marvel that where thou spendest thy time, but also how thou art accompanied. Though the, through the chamomile, the more it is trodden on, the faster it grows, yet youth, the more it is wasted, the sooner it wears. That thou art my son, I have partly thy mother's word, uh, partly my own opinion, but chiefly a villainous trick of thine eye and a foolish hanging of thy nether lip that doth warrant me. If thou be's my son to me, here lies the point. Why being son to me art thou so pointed at? Shall the blessed son of heaven prove a mincer and eat blackberries? Question not be asked. Shall the son of England prove a thief and take purses? A question to be asked. There is a thing, Harry, which thou hast often heard of, and it is known to many in our land by the name of Pitch. This pitch, as the ancient writers do report, doth defile, so doth the company that thou keepst. For Harry, now I do not speak to thee in drink, but in tears. Not in pleasure, but in passion. Not in words only, but in woes also. And yet, there is a virtuous man who I have often noted in thy company, uh, but I know not his name. Uh, what? Manner of man, and it like your majesty. A goodly, portly man of faith, and a corpulent of a cheerful look, a pleasing eye, a most noble carriage. And as I think his age some fifty, or uh, by your lady inclining to threescore. And now I remember me his name. His name is Falstaff. If oh. that man should be lewdly given, he deceiveth me. Mm. For Harry, I see virtue in his looks. If then the tree may be known by the fruit, as the fruit by the tree, then preemptorily I speak it, there is virtue in that false staff. Him keep, him keep with, the rest banish. And tell me now, thou naughty varlet, tell me, where hast thou been this month? Mm. Dost thou speak like a king? Uh, do thou. Stand for me, and I'll play my father. Oh, uh, uh, depose me, if thou dost it half so gravely, so majestically, both in word and matter. Hang me by the heels for a rabbit sucker and a, or a poulter's hair. Well, here am I set. And here I stand. Judge, my masters. Now, Harry, whence come you? My noble lord, from Eastcheap. 
The complaints I hear of thee are grievous. Oh, splud, my lord, they are false. Nay, I'll tickle ye for young prince in faith. <laughs> Where is thou, ungracious boy? Henceforth ne'er look on me. Thou art violently carried away from grace. There is a devil haunts thee in the likeness of an old fat man. A ton of man is thy companion. Why dost thou converse with this, that trunk of humours, that bolting hutch of beastliness, that swollen parcel of dropsies, that huge bombard of sack, that stuffed cloak bag of guts, that roasted manning tree ox with the pudding in his belly, that reverend vice, that grey iniquity, that father ruffian, that vanity in years? Wherein is he good? But to taste sack and drink it too, wherein neat and cleanly, but to carve a capon and eat it, wherein cunning, but in craft, wherein crafty, but in villainy, wherein villainous, but in all things, wherein worthy, but in nothing. I, I would your grace would take me with you. Who means your grace? That villainous. Abominable misleader of youth, Falstaff, that old white bearded Satan. My lord, I know the man. Oh, I know thou dost. Uh, but to say I, I know more harm in him than in myself were to say more than I know that he is old, the more the pity. His white hairs do witness it. But that he is, saving your reverence, a whoremaster, that I utterly deny. If sack and sugar be a fault, God help the wicked. If to be old and merry be a sin, then many an old host that I know is damned. If to be fat, to be, to be hated, then Pharaoh's lean kine are to be loved. No more, my good Lord. Banish Peto. Banish Bardolph. Uh, banish Poins, but for sweet Jack Falstaff, kind Jack Falstaff, true Jack Falstaff, valiant Jack Falstaff, and therefore more valiant being as he is old Jack Falstaff. Banish not him, thy Harry's company. Banish not him, thy Harry's company. Banish plump Jack and banish all the world. I do. I will. Uh, my lord, my lord. The sheriff with a most monstrous watch is at the door. Oh, ye rogue, uh, play uh, out the play. Uh, I have much to say in the behalf of that false staff. Jesus, my lord, my lord. Hey, hey, the devil rides up a fiddlestick. What's the matter? The sheriff and all the watch are at the door. They are come to search the house. Shall I let them in? Uh, dost thou hear, Hal? Never call a true piece of gold a counterfeit. Thou art essentially made without seeming so. And a natural coward without instinct. I deny your major. If you will deny the sheriff so, if not, let him enter. If I become not a cart as well as another man, a plague on my bringing up. I hope I shall as soon be strangled with a halter as another. Go. Oh, hide they behind the arras. The rest walk up above. Now my masters for a true face and a good conscience. Both which I have had, but their date is out and therefore I'll hide me. Call in the sheriff. Mm. Now, Master Sheriff, what is your will with me? First, pardon me, my lord. A hue and cry hath followed certain men unto this house. What? What men? One of them is well known, my gracious lord, a gross, fat man. Mm. As fat as butter. Mm. The man, I do assure you, is not here. 
and for I myself at this time have employed him. And Sheriff, I will engage my word to thee that I will by tomorrow dinner time send him to answer thee, or any man for anything he shall be charged with all. And so, let me entreat you, leave the house. I will, my lord. And there are two gentlemen have in this robbery lost three hundred marks. <clears throat> It may be so. If he had robbed these men, he shall be answerable. And so, farewell. A good night, my noble lord. I think it is a good morrow. Is it not? Indeed, my lord. I think it be two o'clock. The oily rascal is known as well as Paul's. Go call him forth. Well, sir. <laughs> has to sleep behind the arras and snorting like a horse. Oh, oh God, he already fetches presents. <coughs> Search his pockets. <laughs> oh, what else thou found? Nothing but papers, my lord. Let's see what 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 they be. Read them. Uh, item. Item a capon, a two bob bitten tuppence. Item sauce, four pence. Uh, item sack, two gallons, one crown, eight pence. Item anchovies and sack after supper, another two bob bit and a tanner. Item bread, a hay penny. Oh, monstrous. Would one hay penny worth of bread in this intolerable deal of sack? Well, there is else, keep close. We'll read it at more advantage. There, let him sleep till day. Go to the court in the morning. We must all to the wars, and thy place shall be honorable. I'll procure this fat rogue a charge of foot, and I know his death will be to march twelve score. The money shall be paid back with advantage. Be with me betimes in the morning. And so, good morrow, Peter. Good morrow, good my lord. These promises are fair, the parties sure, and our induction full of prosperous hope. Lord, Mor Lord Mortimer and Cousin Glendaro, will you sit down? And Uncle Worcester, ah, plague upon I forgot the map. Oh, here it is. Sit, Cousin Percy, sit, good Cousin Hotspur, for by that name as oft as Lancaster doth speak of you, his cheek looks pale, and with a rising sigh, he wisheth you in heaven. And you in hell, as oft as he hears Owen Glendower spoke of. I cannot blame him. At my nativity, the front of heaven was full of fiery shapes of burning crescents. And at my birth, the frame and huge foundations of the earth shake like a coward. Why, so it would have done at the same season if your mother's cat had but kitten, though yourself had never been born. I say the earth did shake when I was born. And I say the earth was not of my mind, if you suppose as fearing you it shook. The heavens were all on fire. The earth did tremble. Oh, then the earth shook to see the heavens on fire and not in fear of your nativity. Diseased nature oftentimes breaks forth in strange eruptions. Oft the teeming earth is with a kind of uh, colic pinched and vexed by the imprisoning of unruly wind within her womb, which, for enlargement, striving, shakes the old beldam earth and topples down steeples and moss-grown towers. At your birth, our grandam earth, having this distemperature in passion, shook. Cousin, of many men I do not bear these crossings. Give me leave to tell you once again that at my birth, the front of heaven was full of fiery shapes. The goats ran from the mountains and the herds were strangely clamorous into the frighted fields. These signs have marked me at 
extraordinary and all the courses of my life to show I am not of the role of common men. Where is he living? Clipped in with the sea that chides the banks of England, Scotland, Wales, which calls me pupil or hath read to me. Hmm? And bring him out that is but woman's son can trace me in the tedious ways of art and hold me pace in deep experiments. I think there's no man speaks better Welsh. All the dinner. Peace, cousin Percy, you will make him mad. I can call spirits from the basky deep. Why, so can I, or so can any man. But will they come when you do call for them? Why, I can teach you, cousin, to command the devil. Oh, and I can teach thee, cuz, to shame the devil by telling truth. Tell truth and shame the devil. If thou have power to raise him, bring him hither. And I'll be sworn I have power to shame him hence. Ha! While you live, tell truth and shame the devil. Come, come, no more of this unprofitable chat. Three times hath Henry Bullingbrook made head against my power. Thrice from the banks of Wye and Sandy Bottom Seven have I sent him bootless home and weather beaten back. Home without boots and in foul weather, too? How scapes he agues in the devil's name? Come. Here is the map. Shall we divide our right according to the threefold order ten? The archdeacon hath divided it into three limits very equally. England, from Trent and Severn hitherto, by south and east, is to my part assigned. All westward, Wales beyond the Severn shore, and all the fertile land within that bound to Owen Glendower, and, dear cuz, to you, the remnant northward lying off from Trent. And our indentures tripartite are drawn, which being sealed interchangeably, a business that this night may execute, tomorrow, cousin Percy, you and I and my good Lord of Worcester will set forth to meet your father and the Scottish power as is appointed us at Shrewsbury. My father Glendower is not ready yet, nor shall we need his help these 14 days. Within that space, you may have drawn together your tenants, friends, and neighboring gentlemen. A short time shall send me to you, lords, and in my conduct shall your ladies come, from whom you now must steal and take no leave, for there will be a world of what to shed upon the parting of your wives and you. Mm, Methinks my moiety north from Burton here, in quantity equals... Not one of yours. See how this river comes me cranking in and cuts me from the best of all my land, a huge half moon, a monstrous cantle out. Mm, I'll have the current in this place damned up and here the smug and silver trench shall run in a new channel fair and evenly. It shall not wind with such a deep indent to rob me of so rich a bottom here. Not wind? It shall. It must. You see, it doth. Yea, but mark how he bears his course and runs me up with like advantage on the other side, gelding the opposed continent as much as on the other side it takes from you. Yea, but a little charge will trench him here and on this north side win this cape of land and then he runs straight and even. Oh, I'll have it so. A little charge will do it. I'll not have it altered. Will not you? No, no, you shall not. Who shall say me nay? Why, that will I. Oh, let me not understand you then. Speak it in Welsh. I can speak English, Lord, as well as you, for I was trained up in the English court, where being but young, I framed the harp many an English ditty lovely well, and gave the tongue a helpful ornament, a virtue that was never seen in you. Mary. And I'm glad of it with all my heart. I had rather be a kitten and cry mew than one of these same meter ballet mongers. I had rather hear a brazen canstick turned or a dry wheel grate on the axle tree and that would set my teeth nothing in edge, nothing so much as mincing poetry. Tis like the forced gait of a shuffling nag. Come. You shall have Trent turned. I don't care. I'll give thrice so much land to any well-deserving friend. But in the way of bargain, 
Mark you me. I'll cavil on the ninth part of a hair. Are the indentures drawn? Shall we be gone? The moon shines fair. You may away by night. I'll haste to the right, uh, and with all, break with your wives and your departure hence. I am afraid my daughter will run mad, so much she doteth on her mortimer. Fie, cousin Percy, how you cross my father. I cannot choose. Sometimes he angers me with telling me of the mold warp and the ant of the dreamer Merlin and his prophecies and of a dragon and a finless fish, a clipped winged griffin and a molten raven, a couching lion and a ramping cat and such a deal of skimble scamble stuff as puts me from my faith. I tell you what. He held me last night at least nine hours in <laughs> reckoning up the several devil's names that were his lackeys. I cried, oh, oh, and well, go to, but marked him not a word. Oh, oh, he is as tedious as a tired horse, a railing wife, worse than a smoky house. I'd rather live with cheese and garlic in a windmill far than feed on Kate's and have him talk to me in any summer house in Christendom. In faith, he is a worthy gentleman exceedingly well-read and profited in strange concealments, valiant as a lion and wondrous affable and as bountiful as mines of India. Shall I tell you, cousin, he holds your temper in a high respect and curbs himself even of his natural scope when you come cross his humor. Faith, he does. I warrant you, that man is not alive might so have tempted him as you have done without the taste of danger and reproof. But do not use it oft. Let me entreat you. In faith, my lord, you are to willful blame. And since your coming hither have done enough to put him quite besides his patience, you must needs learn, lord, to amend this fault. Though sometimes it show greatness, courage, blood, and that's the dearest grace that renders you. Yet oftentimes it doth present harsh rage, defect of manners, want of government, pride, Haughtiness, opinion, and disdain, the least of which, haunting a nobleman, looseth men's hearts and leaves behind a stain upon the beauty of all parts besides, beguiling them of commendation. Well, I am schooled. Good manners be your speed. Oh, here come our wives. Let us take our leave. Oh, this is the deadly spite that angers me. My wife can speak no English. I know Welsh. Mm -hmm. My daughter weeps. She'll not part with you. She'll be a soldier too. She'll to the wars. Good father, tell her that she and my aunt Percy shall follow in your conduct speedily. Mm. Mm. She is desperate here a peevish self-willed harlotry, one that no persuasion can do good upon. I understand thy looks, that pretty Welsh which thou pourest down from these swelling heavens, I am too perfect in, and but for shame, in such a parley should I answer thee. I understand thy kisses, and thou mine, and that's a feeling disputation. But I will never be a truant love till I have learned thy language, for thy tongue makes Welsh as sweet as Diddy's highly penned, sung by a fair queen in a summer's bower with ravishing division to her lute. Nay, if you melt, then she will run mad. Oh, I am ignorance itself in this. She bids you on the wanton rushes lay down and rest your gentle head upon her lap and she will sing the song that pleaseth you and on your eyelids crown the god of sleep calming your blood with pleasing heaviness making such difference between twixt wake and sleep as is the difference betwixt day and night the hour before that heavenly harness team begins his golden progress in the east with all my heart, I'll sit and hear her sing. By that time will our book, I think, be drawn. Do so. 
and those musicians that shall play to you hang in the air a thousand leagues from hence, and straight they shall be here, sit and attend. Come, Kate, thou art perfect in lying down. Come, quick, quick, that I may lay my head in thy lap. Oh, ye giddy goose. <laughs> Now I perceive the devil understands Welsh, and tis no marvel he is so humorous. By a lady, he's a good musician. Then should you be nothing but musical, for you are altogether governed by humors. I still, ye thief, and hear the lady sing in Welsh. Oh, I would rather hear lady, my brock, howl in Irish. Wouldst thou have thy head broken? No. Then be still. Neither tis a woman's fault. Oh, now God help thee. To the Welsh lady's bed. What's that? Peace, she sings. Mm. Come, Kate, I'll have your song too. Oh, not mine, in good sooth. <laughs> not yours, in good sooth, heart. You swear like a comfort maker's wife, not you in good sooth, and as true as I live, and as God shall mend me, and as sure as day, and gives such sarcenet surety for thy oaths as if thou never walkst further than Finsbury. Swear me, Kate, like a lady as thou art, a good mouth-filling oath, and leave in sooth, and such protest of peppered gingerbread to velvet guards and Sunday citizens. Come, sing. I will not sing. Tis the next way to turn tailor or be red breast teacher and the indentures be drawn all away within these two hours. And so come in when you will. Come, come, Lord Mortimer. You are as slow, as hot, Lord Percy is on fire to go. By this, our book is drawn. We'll but seal and then to horse immediately. With all my heart. Lords, give us leave. The Prince of Wales and I must have some private conference, but be near at hand, for we shall presently have need of you. I know not whether God will have it so for some displeasing service I have done that in his secret doom out of my blood he'll breed revengement and scourge for me. But thou dost in thy passages of life make me believe that thou art only marked for the hot vengeance and the rod of heaven to punish my mistreadings. Tell me else, could such inordinate and low desires, such Poor, such bare, such lewd, such mean attempts, such barren pleasures, rude society as thou art matched with all and grafted to accompany the greatness of thy blood and hold their level with thy princely heart. So please your majesty, I would I could quit all offenses with as clear excuse as, well, I am doubtless I can purge myself of many I am charged with all, yet... Such extenuation let me beg, as in reproof of many tales devised, which off the ear of greatness needs must hear, by smiling pick thanks and base newsmongers. I may, for some things true, wherein my youth hath faulty wandered and irregular, find pardon in my true submission. God pardon thee. Yet let me wonder, Harry, at thy affections, which do hold a wing quite from the flight of all thy ancestors. Thy place and counsel thou hast rudely lost, which by thy younger brother is supplied, and art almost an alien to the hearts of all the court and princes of my blood. The hope and expectation of thy time is ruined, and the soul of every man prophetically do forthink thy fall. Had I so lavish of my presence been, so common hackneyed in the eyes of men, so stale and cheap to vulgar company opinion that did help me to the crown, 
had still kept loyal to possession and left me in reputeless banishment, a fellow of no mark nor likelihood. By seeing, by being seldom seen, I could not stir, but like a comet, I was wondered at that men would tell their children, this is he. Others would say, where, which is Bolingbroke? And then I stole all courtesy from heaven and dressed myself in such humility that I did pluck allegiance from men's hearts, loud shouts and salutations from their mouths, even in the presence of the crowned king. Thus did I keep my person fresh and new, my presence like a robe pontifical, ne'er seen but wondered at, and so my state, seldom but sumptuous, showed like a feast, and won by rareness such solemnity. <laughs> the skipping king, he ambled up and down with shallow jesters and rash bavin wits, soon kindled and soon burnt, carded his state, mingled his royalty with capering fools, had his great name profaned with their scorns, and gave his countenance against his name to laugh at jibing boys and stand the push of every beardless vain comparative, grew a companion to the common streets and fieved himself to popularity. That being daily swallowed by men's eyes, they surfeited with honey and began to loathe the taste of sweetness, whereof a little more than a little is by much too much. So when he had occasion to be seen, he was but as the cuckoo is in June, heard, not regarded, seen, but with such eyes as sick and blunted with community, afford no extraordinary gaze, such as is bent on sun-like majesty when it shines seldom in admiring eyes, but rather drowsed and hung their eyelids down, slept in his face and rendered such aspect as cloudy men use to their adversaries, being with his presence glutted, gorged, and full. And in that very line, Harry, standest thou, for thou hast lost thy princely privilege with vile participation. Not an eye but is a weary of thy common sight, save mine, <laughs> which hath desired to see thee more, <laughs> which now doth that I would not have it do make blind itself with foolish tenderness. I shall hereafter, my thrice gracious lord, be more myself. For all the world, as thou art to this hour, was Richard then, when I from France set foot at Ravenspur. And even as I was then, is Percy now now by my scepter and my soul to boot, he hath more worthy interest to the state than thou, the shadow of succession. For of no right nor color like to right, he doth fill fields with harness in the realm, turns head against the lion's armed jaws, and being no more in debt to years than thou, leads ancient lords and reverend bishops on to bloody battles and bruising arms. What never dying honor hath he got against renowned Douglas, whose high deeds, whose hot incursions and great name in arms holds from all soldiers chief majority and military title capital through all the kingdoms that acknowledge Christ. Thrice hath this Hotspur, Mars, and swaddling clothes, this infant warrior in his enterprises, discomfited great Douglas, taken him once, enlarged him, 
and made a friend of him to fill the mouth of deep defiance up and shake the peace and safety of our throne. And what say you to this? Percy, Northumberland, the Archbishop's Grace of York, Douglas, Mortimer, capitulate against us and are up. But wherefore do I tell these news to thee? Why, Harry, do I tell thee of my foes, which art my nearest and dearest enemy? Thou that art like enough through vassal fear, base inclination, and the start of spleen to fight against me under Percy's pay, to dog his heels and curtsy at his frowns. To show how much thou art degenerate. Do not think so. You shall not find it so. And God forgive them that so much have swayed your majesty's good thoughts away from me. I will redeem all this on Percy's head. And in the closing of some glorious day, be bold to tell you that I am your son. When I will wear a garment all of blood, and stain my favors in a bloody mask, which washed away shall scour my shame with it. And that shall be the day whene'er it lights, that this same child of honor and renown, this gallant hotspur, this all-praised knight, and your unthought-of Harry chance to meet. For every honor sitting on his hymn would that, would that they were multitudes. And on my heads my shame's redoubled, for the time will come that I shall make this Northern youth exchanges glorious deeds for my indignities. Percy is but my factor, good my lord, to engross up glorious deeds on my behalf, and I will call him to so strict an account that he shall render every glory up, yea, even the slightest worship of his time, or I will tear the reckoning from his heart. this. In the name of God, I promise here, I do beseech your majesty may so salve the long-grown wounds of my intemperance. If not, the end of life cancels all bands, and I will die a hundred thousand deaths ere I break the smallest parcel of this vow. A hundred thousand rebels die in this. Thou shalt have charge and sovereign trust herein. How now, good Blunt? <laughs> Thy looks are full of speed. So hath the business that I come to speak of. Lord Mortimer of Scotland hath sent word that Douglas and the English rebels met the 11th of this month at Shrewsbury. A mighty and a fearful head they are, if promises be kept on every hand, as ever offered foul play in a state. The Earl of Westmoreland set forth today, with him, my son, Lord John of Lancaster, for this advertisement is five days old. <sighs> on Wednesday next, Harry, you shall set forward. On Thursday, we ourselves will march. Our meeting is Bridge North. And Harry... You shall march through Gloucestershire, by which account our business valued. Some twelve days hence, our general forces at Bridge North shall meet. Our hands are full of business. Let's away. Advantage feeds him fat while men delay. Oh, Bardolph, am I not fallen away vilely since this last action? Do I not bait? Do I not dwindle? Why, my skin hangs about me like an old lady's loose gown. I am withered like an old apple, John. Well, I'll repent, and that suddenly, while I am in some liking, shall be out of heart shortly, and then I shall have no strength to repent. And I have not forgotten what the inside of a church is made of. I am a peppercorn, a brewer's horse the inside of a church. 
company, villainous company, have been the spoil of me. Sir John, you are so fretful you cannot live long. Why, there it is. Come, sing me a bawdy song and make me merry. I was as virtually, virtuously given as a gentleman need to be. Virtuous enough. Swore in little dice, not above seven times a week. Went to a bawdy house, not above um, once and a quarter of an hour. Uh, paid money that I borrowed three or four times. Lived well and in good compass. And now I live out of all order. Out of all compass. Why, you are so fat, Sir John, that you must needs be all out of compass, all out of reasonable compass, Sir John. Do thou amend thy face, and I'll amend my life. Thou art our admiral, thou bearest the lantern in the poop, but tis in the nose of thee. Thou art the knight of the burning lamp. Why, Sir John, my face does you no harm. No, I'll be sworn. I make as good use of it as many a man doth of a death's head or memento mori. I never see thy face, but I think upon hellfire and dives that lived in purple. For there he is, in his robes, burning, burning. If thou wert given any way, if thou wert any way given to virtue, I would swear by thy face. My oath should be by this fire. That's God's angel. By, but thou art altogether given o'er and wert indeed. But for the light in thy face, the son of utter darkness, when thou ranst up Gadshill in the night to catch my horse, if I did not think thou hadst been an ignis fatus or ball of wildfire, there's no purchase in money. Oh, thou art a perpetual triumph, an everlasting bonfire light. Thou hast saved me thousands of marks and links and torches, walking with thee in the night betwixt tavern and tavern. But the sack that thou hast drunk me would have brought me lights as good cheap at the dearest chandlers in Europe. I have maintained that salamander of yours with fire any time this two and thirty years. God reward me for it. Blood, I word my face were in your belly. God of mercy, so should I be so sure of hot heartburn. <coughs> How name now, Dame Partlet the hen? Have you inquired yet who picked my pocket? What? Sir John? What do you think, Sir John? Do you, do you think I keep thieves in my house? I have searched. I have inquired. So as my husband, man by man, boy by boy, servant by servant, the tithe of a hair was never lost in my house before. You lie, hostess. Bardolph was shaved and lost many a hair, and I'll be sworn my pocket was picked. Go to, you are a woman, go. Oh, why? Oh, no, 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 no. I defy thee. God's like, I was never called so in mine own house before. Go to, I know you well enough. Oh, Sir John, you do not know me. Sir John, uh, I know you, Sir John. You owe me money, Sir John. And now you, 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 you pick a quarrel to beguile me with it? Ha! If, but ah, I bought you a dozen shirts to your back. Mm -hmm. Dullus, filthy Dullus. I have given thee away to baker's wives. They have made bolters of them. Now, as I am a true woman, Holland of eight shillings and L. You, 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 you owe me money here besides, Sir John, for your diet mm -hmm. and, and, and by drinkings and, and, and money lent you four and 20 pound. He had his part of it. Let him pay. He, alas, he is poor. He has nothing. Oh, poor? Look upon his face. What call you rich? Let them coin his nose. Uh, let them coin his cheeks. I'll not pay a denier. Uh, what, will you make me a yonker? Will you make a yonker of me? Shall I not take mine ease and mine in? But I shall have my pocket picked. I have long lost a seal ring of my grandfather's worth 40 mark. Oh, Jesu. I have heard the prince tell him I know not how often. 
that that ring was copper. How? Uh, the prince is a jack. A sneak up. Splodney were here. I would cudgel him like a dog if he would say so. Uh, how now, lad? Is the wind in the door? Uh, Faith, must we all march? Yay, two and two, Newgate fashion. My lord, I pray you hear me. Pass thou mistress quickly. How doth thy husband? I love him well. He's an honest man. Good, my lord. Uh, hear me? Uh, prithee, let her alone. List to me. What sayest thou, Jack? Uh, the other night I, I fell asleep here behind the heirs and had my pocket picked. This house is turned body house. They pick pockets. Mm, what didn't thou lose, Jack? Wilt thou believe me, Hal? Three or four bonds of forty pound apiece and a seal ring of my grandfather's. Oh, a trifle. Uh, some eight penny matter. So I told him, my lord, I, 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 and, and I said, I heard your grace say so. And my lord, he, he speaks most vilely of you like a foul-mouthed man as he is and said he would cudgel you what oh. he did not oh there's neither faith truth nor womanhood in me else mm. there's no more faith in thee than in a stewed prune no no more truth in thee than in a drawn fox and for womanhood may marion may be the deputy's wife of the ward to thee go you thing go Say, what thing? What thing? What thing? Why, a thing to thank God on. I am no thing to thank God on. I would, should that, should, thou shouldst know it. I, I, I am an honest man's wife, and setting thy knighthood aside, thou art a knave to call me so. Setting thy womanhood aside, thou art a beast to say otherwise. Oh, say what beast, thou knave, thou? Oh, what beast? Why an otter? An otter? Sir John, why? Why an otter? Why? She's neither fish nor flesh. A man knows not where to have her. <gasps> oh, thou art an unjust man in saying so. Thou or any man knows where to have meat, thou knave, thou. Thou sayest true, hostess, and he slanders thee most grossly. Oh, so he doth, you lord, you my lord, and, and said this the other day, you want him a thousand pounds. Oh, Sirrah, do I owe you a thousand pounds? A thousand pound, hell? Mm. A million. Thy love is worth a million. Thou owest me thy love. Nay, my lord, he called you Jack and said he would cudgel you. Oh, did I, Bardolph? Indeed, Sir John, you said so. Yea, if he said my ring was copper. Well, I say tis copper. Darest thou be as good as thy word now? Why, Al, thou knowest as thou art but man, I dare. But as thou art prince, I fear thee as I fear the roaring of the lion's whelp. And why not as the lion? The king himself is to be feared as the lion. Dost thou think I'll fear thee as I fear thy father? Nay, and I do, uh, and I do, I, I pray God my girdle break. Oh, if it should, how would thy guts fall about thy knees? But Sirrah, there's no room for faith, truth, nor honesty in this bosom of thine. It is all filled up with guts and midriff. Charge an honest woman with picking my pocket. What? Why, thou whoreson, impudent, embossed rascal, if there were anything in thy pockets but tavern reckonings, memorandums of body houses, and one poor pennyworth of sugar candy to make thee long-winded, if thy pocket were enriched with any other injuries but these, I am a villain. And yet, you will stand to it. You will not pocket up wrong. Art thou not ashamed? Dost thou hear, Hal? Thou knowest in the state of innocency Adam fell, and what should poor Jack Falstaff do in these days of villainy? Thou seest I have more flesh than another man, and therefore more frailty. You confess then that you picked my pocket. It appears so by the story. Hostess. 
I forgive thee. Go make ready breakfast, love thy husband, look to thy servants, cherish thy guests. Thou shalt find me tra tra tractable to an, any honest reason. Thou seest I am pacified still. Nay, prithee, be gone. Now, hell, to the news at court for the robbery. Lad, how is that answered? Oh, my sweet beef. I must still be good angel to thee. The money is paid back again. Oh, I do not like that paying back tis a double labor. I am good friends with my father and may do anything. Rob me the exchequer. The first thing thou do doest, and do it with unwashed hands too. Oh, do, my lord. I have procured thee, Jack. A charge of foot. I would it have been of horse. Where shall I find one that can steal well? Oh, for a fine thief of the age of two and twenty or thereabouts. I'm heinously unprovided. Well, God be thanked for these rebels. They offend none but the virtuous. I laud them. I praise them. Bardolph? My lord. Go. Bear this letter to Lord John of Lancaster. T to my brother, John. And uh, this to my lord of Westmoreland. Go, Peto, to horse, to horse, for thou and I have thirty miles to ride yet ere dinner. Jack, meet me tomorrow in the temple hall at two o'clock in the afternoon. There shalt thou know thy charge, and there receive money and order for their furniture. The land is burning. Percy stands on high, and either we or they must lower lie. Rare words. Brave world. Hostess, my breakfast come. Oh, I could wish this tavern were my drum. Well said, my noble Scot. If speaking truth in this fine age were not thought flattery, such attribution should the Douglas have, as not a soldier of this season stamp should go so general current through the world. By God, I cannot flatter. I do defy the tongues of soothers, but a braver place in my heart's love hath no man than yourself. Nay, task me to my word. Approve me, Lord. Thou art the king of honor. No man so poor and breathed upon the ground, but I revere it him. Do so, and tis well. Oh, what letters hast thou there? I can but thank you. The, these letters come from, from your, your father. Letters from him? Why comes he not himself? He, he cannot come. My lord, he is grievous sick. Doons! How is he the leisure to be sick in such a justling time? Who leads his power? Under whose government come they along? His letters bear his mind, my lord, not I. I, I prithee, tell me, doth he keep his bed? He did, my lord, four days ere I sent forth. Then in that time of my departure th thence, he was much feared by his physicians. I would the state of time had first been whole, or he by sickness had been visited. His health was never better worth than now. Sick now? Droop now? This sickness doth infect the very lifeblood of our enterprise. Tis catching hither, even to our camp, he writes me here, that inward sickness, and that his friends, by deputation, could not so soon be drawn, or did he think it meet to lay so dangerous and dear a trust on any soul removed, but on his own? Yet doth he give us bold advertisement that with our small conjunction we should on, to see how fortune is disposed to us, for as he writes, there is no quailing now, because the king is certainly possessed of all our purposes. What say you to it? Your father's sickness is a maim to us. Oh, a perilous gash. A very limb lopped off. And yet, if faith, it is not. His present want seems more than we shall find it. Were it good to set the exact wealth of all our states all at one cast? To set so rich a main on the nice hazard of one doubtful hour? It were not good, for therein should we read the very bottom and the soul of hope. 
the very least, the very utmost bound of all our fortunes. Faith, and so we should. Where now remains a sweet reversion, we may boldly spend upon the hope of what is to come in. A comfort of retirement lives in this. A rendezvous, a home to fly unto, if that the devil and mischance look big upon the maidenhead of our affairs. But yet, I would your father had been here. The quality and hair of our attempt brooks no division. It will be thought by some that know not why he is away, that wisdom, loyalty, and your dislike of our proceedings kept the earl from hence. And think how such an apprehension may turn the tide of fearful faction and breed a kind of question in our cause. For well you know, we of the offering side must keep aloof from strict arbitrament and stop all sight holes, every loop from whence the eye of reason may pry in upon us. This absence of your father's draws a curtain that shows the ignorant a kind of fear before not dreamt of. You strain too far. I rather of his absence make this use. It lends a luster of more great opinion, a larger dare to our great enterprise than if the Earl were here. For men must think if we without his help can make a head to push against the kingdom with his help, we shall o'erturn it topsy-turvy down. Yet all goes well, yet all our joints are whole. As hurt can think, there is not such a word spoke of in Scotland as this term of fear. Ah, my cousin Vernon, welcome by my soul. Pray God my news be worth a welcome, Lord. The Earl of Westmoreland, 7,000 strong, is marching hitherwards. With him, Prince John. <laughs> no harm. What more? And further, I have learned the king himself in person is set forth on, or hitherwards intended speedily with strong and mighty preparation. Oh, he shall be welcome too. Where is his son? The nimble-footed and madcap Prince of Wales and his comrades that daft the world aside and bid it pass. All furnished, all in arms, all bloomed like estrages that with the wind baited like eagles, having lately bathed glittering gold and coats like images as full of spirits as the month of May. Gorgeous! The sun at midsummer wanton his youthful goats, wild as young bulls. I saw young Harry with his beaver on, his cushions on his thighs, gallantly armed, rise from the ground like feathered mercury and vaulted with such ease into his seat as if an angel dropped down from the clouds to turn and wind a fiery pegasus in which the world with noble horsemanship. No more. No more! Worse than the sun in March, this praise doth nourish agues. Let them come! They come like sacrifices in their trim, and to the fire-eyed maid of smoky war, all hot and bleeding will, we Offer them the mailed marshal on his altar sit up to the ears in blood. I am on fire to hear this rich reprisal is so nigh and yet not ours. Come, come, let me taste my horse. Who is it to bear me like a thunderbolt against the bosom of the Prince of Wales? Harry to Harry shall. Hot horse to horse. Meet in their part till one drop down a course. Oh, that Glendower will come. There is more news. I learned in Worcester as I rode along. He cannot draw his power this 14 days. That's the worst tidings that I hear of yet. Aye, by my faith, that bears a frosty sound. What made the king's whole battle reach unto? To 30,000. Ah, 40! Let it be! My father and Glendower being both away, the powers of us may serve so great a day. Come! Let us take a muster speedily. Doomsday is dear, is near. Die, all, die, merrily! Talk not of dying. I am out of fear of death or death's hand for this one half year. 
Bartle, get thee before the Coventry. Fill me a bottle of sack. Our soldiers shall march through. We'll to Sutton Company, Coalfield tonight. Uh, will you uh, give me money, Captain? Lay out, lay out. This bottle makes an angel. And if it do, take it for thy labor. And if it make 20, take them all. I'll answer the coinage. Bid my Lieutenant Pito meet me at Townsend. I will, Captain. Farewell. If I be not ashamed of my soldiers, I am a soost gurnet. I have misused the king's press damnably. I've got an exchange of 150 soldiers, 300 odd pounds. I press me none, but good soldiers, yeoman's sons, inquire me out contracted bachelors, such as had been asked twice on the banes, such a commodity of warm slaves as had as leaf hear the devil as a drum, such as fear the reports of a caliver worse than a struck fowl or a hurt wild duck. I press me none but such toasts and butter with hearts in their bellies no bigger than pins heads. And they have bought out their services. And now my whole charge consists of ancient corporals, lieutenants, gentlemen of companies, slaves as ragged as Lazarus in painted cloth, where the glutton dogs lick his sores, such as indeed were never soldiers. But I discarded unjust serving men, younger sons to younger brothers, revolted tapsters and ostlers trade fallen, Cankers of a calm world and long peace. Ten times more dishonorable, ragged than all fees ancient. Such have I so filled up the room of them as have bought out their services that you would think that I had had 150 tottered prodigals lately come from swine keeping, from eating drafts and a husk. A mad fellow met me on the way and told me I had unloaded all the gibbets and pressed the dead bodies. No eye has seen such scarecrows. I'll not march through Coventry with them, that's flat. Nay, and the villains march wide betwixt the legs of the, as if they had their jives on. For indeed, I had the most of them out of prison. There's not an assured and a half in all the company. And the half shirts is two napkins tacked together and thrown over their shoulders like a herald's coat without sleeves. And the shirt... To say the truth, stolen from my host at St. Albans, or the red-nosed innkeeper of Daventry. But that's all one. They'll find linen enough on every hedge. Oh, how now, blown Jack? How now, quilt? What hell? How now, mad wag? What a devil dost thou in Warwick, Warwick sir? Uh, my lord of Westmoreland, I, I cry you mercy. I thought your honor had already been at Shrewsbury. Faith, Sir John, tis more than time that I were there. And you too, but my powers are there already. The king, I can tell you, looks for us all. We must all away tonight. Tut, <laughs> never fear me. I am as a, am, I am as vigilant as a cat to steal cream. I think to steal cream indeed, for thy theft hath already made thee butter. But tell me, Jack, whose <laughs> fellows are thee that come after? Mine, Hal, mine. I did never see such pitiful rascals. Tut tut. Good, good enough to toss. Food for powder. Food for powder. They'll fill a pit as well as better. Uh, touch man, mortal men. Mortal men. Ay, but Sir John methinks they are exceeding poor and bare. Too beggarly. Faith for their poverty, I know not what they ha had had. That, and for their bareness, I am sure they never learned that of me. No, I'll be sworn, unless they, you call three fingers in the ribs bare. But, Sirrah, make haste. Percy is already in the field. What is the king encamped? He is, Sir John. I fear we shall stay too long. Well, to the latter end of the fray and the beginning of a feast fits a dull fighter and a keen guest. We'll fight with him tonight. It may not be. You give him then the advantage. Not a wit. I say you so. Looks he not for supply? 
So do we. His is certain, ours is doubtful. Good cousin, be advised, dear not tonight. Do not, my lord. You do not counsel well. You speak it out of fear and cold heart. Do me no slander, Douglas. By my life, and I dare well maintain it with my life, if well-respected honor bid me on, I hold as little counsel with weak fear as you, my lord, or any Scot that this day lives. Let it be seen tomorrow in the battle which of us fears. Aye, or tonight. Content. Night, say I. Come, come, it may not be. I wonder much being men of such great leading as you are, that you foresee not what impediments drag back our expedition. Certain horse of my cousin Vernon's are not yet come up. Your uncle Worcester's horses came but today, and now their pride and mettle is asleep, their courage with hard labor, tame and dull, that not a horse is half the half of himself. So are the horses of the enemy in general journey baited and brought low. The better part of ours are full of rest. The number of the king exceedeth our... For God's sake, cousin, stay till I'll come in. I come with gracious offers from the king, if you vouchsafe me hearing and respect. Welcome, Sir Walter Blunt. And would to God you were of our determination. Some of us love you well. And even though some envy your great deservings and good name, because you are not of our quality, but stand against us like an enemy. And God defend, but still I should stand so. So long as out of limit and true rule, you stand against anointed majesty. But to my charge, the king hath sent to know the nature of your griefs, and whereupon you conjure from the breast of civil peace such bold hostility, teaching his duteous land audacious cruelty. If that the king have any way your good deserts forgot, which he confesseth confesseth to be manifold, he bids you name your griefs, and with all speed you shall have your desires with interest, and pardon absolute for yourself and these herein misled by your suggestion. The king is kind, and well we know the king knows at what time to promise, when to pay. My father and my uncle and myself did give him that same royalty he wears, and when he was not six and twenty strong, sick in the world's regard, wretched and low, a poor, unminded outlaw sneaking home, my father gave him welcome to the shore. And when he heard him swear and vow to God, he came but to the Duke of Lancaster to sue his livery and beg his peace with tears of innocency and terms of zeal. My father in kind heart and pity moved, swore him assistance and performed it too. Now, when the lords and barons of the realm perceived Northumberland did lean to him, the more and less came in with cap and knee, met him in boroughs, cities, villages, attended him on bridges, stood in lanes, laid gifts before him, proffered him their oaths, gave him their heirs as pages, followed him even at the heels in golden multitudes. He presently, as greatness knows itself, steps me a little higher than his vow made to my father while his blood was poor upon the naked shore of Ravensburg, and now forsooth takes on him to reform some certain edicts and some straight decrees that lie too heavy on the commonwealth, cries out upon abuses, seems to weep over his country's wrongs, and by this face, this seeming brow of justice, did he win the hearts of all that he did angle for, proceeded further, cut me off the heads of all the favorites that the absent king and deputation left behind him here when he was personal in the Irish war. Tut. I came not to hear this. 
Then to the point, in short time after, he deposed the king. Soon after that, deprived him of his life. And in the neck of that, tasked the whole state. To make that worse, suffered his kinsman march, who is, if every owner were well placed, indeed his king, to be engaged in Wales, there without ransom to lie forfeited, disgraced me in my happy victories, sought to entrap me by intelligence, rated mine uncle from the council board, enraged, dismissed my father from the court, broke oath on oath, committed wrong on wrong, and in conclusion, drove us to seek this head of safety and withal to pry into his title, the which we find too indirect for long continuance. Shall I return this answer to the king? <laughs> Not so, Sir Walter. We'll withdraw a while. Go to the king and let there be in pawn some surety for a safe return again. And in the morning early shall mine uncle bring him our purposes. So farewell. I would you would accept his, would accept of grace and love. Maybe we shall. Pray God you do. Hi, good Sir Michael. Bear this sealed brief with winged haste to the Lord Marshal. This to my cousin Scroop and all the rest to whom they are directed. If you knew how much they do import, you would make haste. My good Lord, I guess their tenor. Like enough you do. Tomorrow, good Sir Michael, is a day wherein the fortune of 10,000 men must bide the touch. For, sir, at Shrewsbury, as I am truly given to understand, the king with mighty and quick raised power meets with Lord Harry. And I fear, Sir Michael, that with the sickness of Northumberland, whose power was in the first proportion, and what with Owen Glendower's absence thence, who with them was a rated sinew too, and comes not in, or ruled by prophecies, I fear the power of Percy is too weak to wage an instant trial with the king. Why, my good lord, you need not fear. There is Douglas and Lord Mortimer. No, Mortimer is not there. But there is Mordrake, Vernon, Lord Harry Percy, and there is my lord of Worcester and, and a head of gallant warriors, noble gentlemen. And so there is. But yet the king hath drawn the special head of all the land together, the Prince of Wales, Lord John of Lancaster, the noble Westmoreland and warlike Blunt, and many more carivals and dear men of estimation and command in arms. I doubt not, my lord, they shall be well opposed. I hope no less. Yet needful tis to fear, and to prevent the worst, Sir Michael, speed. For if Lord Percy thrive not, ere the king dismiss his power, he means to visit us, for he hath heard of our confederacy, and tis but wisdom to make strong against him. Therefore, make haste. I must go right again. Uh, to other friends, and so farewell, Sir Michael. How bloodily the sun begins to peer above yon bulky hill. The day looks Pale at his distempered distemperature. <laughs> the southern wind doth play the trumpet to his purposes, and by his hollow whistling in the leaves foretells a tempest on a blustering day. Then with the losers let it sympathize, for nothing can seem foul to those that win. <laughs> How now, my lord of Worcester? Tis not well that you and I should meet upon such terms as now we meet. You have deceived our trust and made us doff our easy robes of peace to crush our old limbs in ungentle steel. This is not well, my lord, this is not well. What say you to it? Will you again unknit this churlish knot of all abhorred war and move in that obedient orb again where you did give a fair and natural light and be no more an exhaled meteor, a prodigy of fear, and a portent of broached mischief to the unborn times? 
Hear me, my liege, for my own part. I could be well content to entertain the lag end of my life with quiet hours. For I protest I have not sought the day of this dislike. You have not sought it? How comes it then? Rebellion lay in his way and he found it. Peace, Stuart, peace. It pleased your majesty to turn your looks of favor from myself and all our house. And yet I must remember you, my lord, we were the first and dearest of your friends. For you, my staff of office did I break in Richard's time and posted day and night to meet you on the way and kiss your hand when you were in when you were in place and in account, nothing so strong and fortunate as I. It was myself, my brother and his son, that brought you home and boldly did out there the dangers of the time. You swore to us and you did swear that, oh, the Doncaster, and that you did nothing purpose against the state, nor claim no further than your new fallen right, the seat of Gaunt, dukedom of Lancaster. To this, we swore our aid. In short space it rained down, fortune showering on your head, and such a flood of greatness fell on you. What with our help? What with the absent kink? What with the injuries of a wanton time, the seeming sufferances that you had borne, and the contrarious winds that held the king so long in his unlucky Irish wars, that all in England didn't repute him dead? And from this swarm of fair advantages, you took occasion to be quickly wooed, to gripe the general sway into your hand, forgot your oath to us at Doncaster. <laughs> and being fed by us, used us so, as that ungentle gull, the cuckoo's bird, used the sparrow, did oppress our nest, grew by our feeding to so great a bulk that even our love durst not come near your sight for fear of swallowing. But with nimble wing, we were enforced for safety's sake to fly out of your sight and raise this present head whereby we stand opposed by such means as you yourself have forged against yourself by unkind usage, dangerous countenance and violation of all faith and trust sworn to us in your younger enterprise. These things indeed you have articulate proclaimed at market crosses, read in churches, to face the garment of rebellion with some fine color that may please the eye of fickle changelings and poor discontents, which gape and rub the elbow at the news of hurly-burly innovation. And never yet did insur insurrection want such watercolors to impaint his cause, nor moody beggars starving for a time of pell-mell havoc and confusion. In both your armies, there is many a soul shall pay full dearly for this encounter, if once you join in trial. Tell your nephew, the Prince of Wales doth join with all the world in praise of Henry Percy. By my hopes, this present enterprise set off his head. I do not think a braver gentleman, more active, more valiant, more valiant young, more daring, or more bold, is now alive to grace this latter age with noble deeds. For my part... I may speak it to my shame. I have a truant been to chivalry. And so I hear he doth account me too. Yet this before my father's majesty, I am content that he shall take the odds of this great name and estimation and will to save the blood on either side, try fortune with him in a single fight. And Prince of Wales, so dare we venture thee, albeit considerations infinite do make against it. No, good Worcester, no. We love our people well, even those we love that are misled upon your cousin's part. And will they take the offer of our grace, both he and they and you? Yea, every man shall be my friend again, and I'll be his. So tell your cousin, 
and bring me word what he will do. But if he will not yield, rebuke and dread correction wait on us, and they shall do their office. So be gone. We will not now be troubled with reply. We offer fair. Take it advisedly. will not be accepted on my life. The Douglas and the Hotspur both together are confident against the world at arms. Hence, therefore, every leader to his charge. For on their answer we will set on them, and God befriend us as our cause is just. Hell, if thou see me down in the battle and, best and bestride me so, it is a point of friendship. Nothing but a colossus can do thee that friendship. Say thy prayers and farewell. I would twere bedtime hell and all well. Why, thou owest God a death. <laughs> Tis not due yet. I would be loath to pay him before his day. What need I be so forward with him that calls not on me? Well, tis no matter. Honor pricks me on, yea. But how if honor pricked me off when I come on? Well then, can honor set a leg? No. Or an arm? No. Or take away the grief of a wound? No. Honor hath no skill in surgery then. No. What is honor? A word. What is in that word honor? What is that honor? Air. A trim reckoning. Who hath it? He that died a Wednesday, doth he feel it? No. Doth he hear it? No, tis insensible then, yea, to the dead, but will not live long with the living? No, why? Detraction will not suffer it, therefore all none of it. Honor is a mere scrunching. So ends my catechism. Oh, no. My nephew must not know, Sir Richard, the liberal and kind offer of the king. For best he did. Then are we all undone? It is not possible. It cannot be. The king should keep his word in leaving us. He will suspect us still and find a time to punish this offense and other faults. Supposition all our lives shall be stuck full of eyes, for treason is but trusted like the fox, who never so tame, so cherished, and looked up, will have a wild trick of his ancestors. Look how we can, or sad or merrily, interpretation will misquote our looks, and we shall feed like oxen at a stall, the better cherished, still the near death. My nephew's trespass may be well for God. It hath the excuse of youth and heat of blood and an adopted name of privilege, a harebrained hotspur governed by a spleen. All his offenses live upon my head and on his father's. We did train him on, and his, cor his corruption being tamed from us, we as the spring of all shall pay for all. Therefore, good cousin, let not Harry know in any case the offer of the king. Deliver what you will. I'll say to you, sir. Here comes your cousin. My uncle is returned. Deliver up, my lord of Westmoreland. Uncle, what news? The king will bid you battle presently. Defy him by the lord of Westmoreland. Lord Douglas, go you and tell him so. Marry and shall, and very willingly. There is no seeming mercy in the king. Did you beg any? God forbid! I told him gently of our grievances, of his oath-breaking, which he meant it thus, by now forswearing that he is forsworn. He calls us rebels, traitors, and he will scorch with haughty arms this hateful name in us. 
Armed gentlemen, to arms, for I have thrown a brave defiance in King Henry's teeth, and Westmoreland that was engaged did bear it, which cannot choose but bring him quickly on. The Prince of Wales stepped forth before the king and nephew, challenged you to single fight. Oh, would the quarrel lay upon our heads? and that no man might draw a short breath today, but I and Harry Monmouth. Tell me, tell me, how showed his asking? Seemed it in contempt? No, no to by my soul, I never in my life did hear a challenge urged more modestly, unless a brother should a brother dare to gentle exercise and a, a proof of arms. He gave you all the duties of a man trimmed up your praises with a princely tongue uh, spoke your deservings like a chronicle, um, making you even better than his praise by still dispraising praise valued with you, and which became him like a prince indeed. He made a blushing cycle of himself, and chid his truant youth with such a grace, as if he mastered there a, a double spirit of teaching and of learning instantly. There did he pause, but let me tell the world, if he outlive the envy of this day, England did never, ne ne did never, oh, so sweet a hope, so much misconstrued in his wantonness. Cousin, I think thou art enamored on his follies. <laughs> never did I hear of any prince so wild a liberty, but be he as he will, Yet once ere night I will embrace him with a soldier's arm, that he shall shrink under my courtesy. Arm! Arm with speed! And fellows, soldiers, friends, better consider what you have to do than I, that have not well the gift of tongue, can lift your blood up with persuasion. My lord, here are letters for you. I cannot read them now. Ha, ah, gentlemen, the time of life is short. To spend that shortness basely were too long if life did ride upon a dial's point, still ending at the arrival of an hour. And if we live, we live to tread on kings, if die, brave death, when princes die with us. Now for our consciences, the arms are fair when the intent of bearing them is just. My lord, the king comes on apace. Oh, I thank him that he cuts me from my tail, for I profess not talking, only this. Let each man do his best. And here, draw a sword whose temper I intend to stain with the best blood that I can meet with all in the adventure of this perilous day. Now, Esperance, Percy, and Seton, sound all the lofty instruments of war. And by that music, let us all embrace for heaven to earth. Some of us shall never a second time do such a courtesy. Ah what is thy name, that in battle thus thou crossest me? What honor dost thou seek upon my head? Oh, then, my name is Douglas, and I do haunt thee in the battle thus, because some tell me that thou art a king. They tell thee true. The Lord of Stafford, dear today, hath bought thy likeness, for instead of thee, King Harry, this sword hath ended him. So shall it be, unless thou yield thee as my prisoner, I was not born a yielder, thou proud Scot, and thou shalt find a king that will revenge Lord Stafford's death. Ah! 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 Oh, Douglas, hadst thou fought at Holmden thus, I never had triumphed upon a Scot. All's done, all's won. Here breathless lies the king. Where? Here. This, Douglas? <laughs> no. Oh, I know this face full well. A gallant knight he was. His name was Blunt. Semblably furnished like the king himself. A fool goeth thy soul, whither it goes. 
a borrowed title as thou bought too dear. Why didst thou tell me that thou wert a king? The king hath many marching in his coats. Oh, now by my sword I will kill all his courts, all murder all his wardrobe, piece by piece, until I meet the king. Up and away! Our soldiers stand full fairly for the day! Ah! Walter Blunt, there's, there's honor for you. Here's no vanity. I am as hot as molten lead and as heavy too. God keep lead out of me. I need no more weight than mine own bowels. I have led my ragamuffins where they are peppered. There's not three of my 150 left alive. They are four towns and to beg during life. But who comes here? Why standest thou idle here? Lend me thy sword. Many a nobleman lies stark and stiff under the vaunting hooves of enemies whose deaths are yet unrevenged. I prithee, lend me thy sword. Oh, hell, I prithee, give me leave to breathe. Yeah, he is indeed. And living to kill thee, I prithee, lend me thy sword. Nay, before God, Hal, if Percy be alive, thou gets not my sword, but take my pistol if thou wilt. Take my pistol if thou wilt. What? Give me that. What, what, what is in this case? Ay, Hal, tis hot, tis hot. There's that will sack a city. What is this time to jest and dally now? Well, if Percy be alive, I'll pierce him. If he do come in my way, so if he do not, if not, I, I come in his willingly. Let him make a carbonado of me. I like not such grinning honor as Sir Walter hath. Give me life, which I can save, so not honor comes unlooked for. And there's an end. I prithee, Harry, withdraw thyself. Thou bleedest too much. Lord John of Lancaster, go you with him. But not I, my lord, unless I did bleed too. I beseech your majesty, make up, lest your retirement do amaze your friends. I will do so. My lord Westmoreland, lead him to his tent. Come, my lord, I'll lead you to your tent. Lead me, my lord. I do not need your help. And God forbid a, a shallow scratch should drive the Prince of Wales from such a field as this, where stained nobility lies trodden on and rebels' arms triumph in massacres? We breathe too long. Come, Cousin Westmoreland. Our duty this way lies. For God's sake, come. By God, thou hast deceived me, Lancaster. I did not think thee a lord of such spirit. Before I loved thee as a brother, John, but now I do respect thee as my soul. I saw him lo hold Lord Percy at the point with lustier maintenance than I did look for of such an ungrown warrior. Oh, this boy lends metal to us all. Another king? They grow like Hydra's heads. I am the Douglas, fatal to all those who wear those colors on him. What art thou, a counterfeit to the person of a king? The king himself, who, Douglas, grieves at heart, so many of his shadows thou hast met, and not the very king. I have two boys, seek Percy and thyself about the field, but seeing thou fallst on me so luckily, I will assay thee and defend thyself. I fear thou art another counterfeit, and yet a faith thou bearest thee like a king, but mine I am sure thou art, whoe'er thou be, and thus... <laughs> hold up thy head, vile Scott, or thou art like never to hold it up again. The spirit of valiant Shirley, Stafford, Blunt are in my arms. It is the Prince of Wales that threatens thee, who never promiseth, but he means to pay. <laughs> Surely, my lord, how fares your grace? Sir Nicholas Gauzy hath for succor sent, and so hath Clifton. I'll to Clifton straight. Stay and breathe a while. 
thou hast redeemed thy lost opinion and showed thou makest some tender of my life in this fair rescue thou hast brought to me. Oh, God. They did me too much injury that ever said I hearkened for your death. If it were so, I might have let alone the insulting hand of Douglas over you, which would have been as speedy in your end as all the poisonous potions in the world and saved the treacherous labor of your son. Make up to Clifton. I'll to Sir Nicholas Gawsey. If I mistake not, thou art Harry Monmouth. Thou speakest as if thou if I would deny my name. My name is Harry Percy. Well, why then I see a very valiant rebel of the name of I am the Prince of Wales, and think not, Percy, to share with me in glory any more. Two stars cannot keep their motion in one sphere, nor can one England brook a double reign of Harry Percy and the Prince of Wales. Nor shall it, Harry, for the hour has come to end the one of us, and would to God thy name in arms were now as great as mine. <laughs> I'll make it greater ere I part from thee, and all the budding honors of thy crest I'll crop to make a garland for my head. I can no longer brook thy vanities. Ha! Well said, Hal, to it, Hal. Nay, you shall find no boys play here, I can tell you. <laughs> Oh. 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 oh, Harry, uh. thou hast robbed me of my youth. I better brook the loss of brittle life than those proud titles thou hast won of me. They wound my thoughts worse than the sword my flesh. But thoughts, the slaves of life and life, time's fool in time, that takes survey of all the world must have a stop. <sighs> I could prophesy but that the earthy and cold hand of death lies on my tongue. No, Percy, thou art dust and food for, for worms. Brave Percy, fairly well, great heart. Ill weaved ambition, how much art thou shrunk when that this body did contain a spirit, a kingdom, for it was too small a bound, but now two paces of the vilest earth is room enough. This earth that bears thee dead bears not alive, so stout a gentleman. If it were sensible of courtesy, I should make thee a dear show of zeal. But let my favours hide thy mangled face. Then even in thy behalf I thank myself in doing these fair rites of tenderness. Adieu, and take thy praise with thee to heaven. Thy ignominy sleep with thee in the grave, but not remembered in thy epitaph. What old acquaintance? Could not all this flesh keep in a little life? Poor Jack. Very well. Could have better spared a better man. I should have a heavy miss of thee if it were not love with vanity. Death hath not struck so fat a deer today. No many dearer in this bloody fray. Emboweled will I see thee by and by. Till then in blood thy noble Percy lie. Emboweled? If thou if I if thou embowel me today, I'll give you leave to powder me and eat me tomorrow. It's blood. Twas time to counterfeit or that hot term against Scott had paid me Scott and Lot too. <laughs> counterfeit? I lie. I am no counterfeit. To die is to be a counterfeit, for he is but a counterfeit of a man who hath not the life of a man. But to counterfeit dying when a man liveth, thereby liveth, is to be no counterfeit, but the true and perfect image of a life. Indeed, 
the better part of valor is discretion. In the which better part, I have saved my life. Zunes, I am afraid of this gunpowder Percy, though he be dead. How have you should counterfeit too and rise? By my faith, I am afraid he would prove the better counterfeit. Uh, therefore, I'll make him sure, yea. Uh, and I swear I killed him, which may not, why may he not rise as well as I? Nothing confutes me but eyes and nobody sees me. Thereby, Sarah, ha! With a new wound in thy thigh, come you along with me. Uh, oh. Come, brother John. Full bravely hast thou fleshed thy maiden sword. A bit soft. Whom have we here? Did you not tell me this fat man was dead? No. I did. I saw him dead, breathless and bleeding on the ground. Art thou alive? Or is it the fantasy that plays upon our eyesight, I prithee speak. For we will not trust our eyes without our ears. Thou art not what thou seemst. No, that's certain. I am not a double man. But if I be not Jack Falstaff, then am I, am I a Jack? There is Percy. If your father will do me any honor, so. If not, let him kill the next Percy himself. I look to be either Earl or Duke, I can assure you. Why, <laughs> Percy, I killed myself and saw thee dead. Didst thou? Lord, Lord, how the world is given to lying. I grant you, I was down and out of breath, and so was he. But we rose both in an instant and fought, and a long hour by Shrewsbury clock. I may, if I may be believed so, if not, let them that should reward valor bear the sin upon their own heads. I take it upon my death. I gave him this wound in the thigh. If the man were alive and would deny it zoons, I would make him eat a piece of my sword. His is the strangest tale that ever I heard. This is the strangest fellow, Brother John. Come, <laughs> bring that your luggage nobly on your back. For my part, if a lie may do thee grace, I'll gild it with the happiest terms I have. The trumpet sounds retreat. The day is ours. Come, brother, let us to the highest field to see what friends are living or are dead. I'll follow as they say for reward. He that rewards me, God reward him. If I do grow great, I grow less, for I'll purge and leave sack and live cleanly as a nobleman should do. <sighs> Thus ever did rebellion find rebuke. Ill-spirited Worcester, did not we send grace, pardon, and terms of love to all of you? And wouldst thou turn our offers contrary, misuse the tenor of thy kinsman's trust? Three knights upon our party slain today, a noble earl, and many a creature else had been alive this hour, if like a Christian thou hadst truly borne betwixt our army's true intelligence. What I have done, my safety urged me to, and I embrace this fortune patiently, since not to be avoided, it falls on me. Bear Worcester to the death, and Vernon too. Other offenders we will pause upon. How goes the field? The noble Scot, Lord Douglas, when he saw the fortune of the day quite turned from him, the noble Percy slain and all his men upon the foot of fear fled with the rest. And falling from a hill, he was so bruised with the pursuers took that, that the pursuers took him. <sighs> At my tent, the Douglases, and I beseech your grace, I may dispose of him. With all my heart. And then, Brother John of Lancaster, to you this honorable bounty shall belong. Go to the Douglas, and deliver him upon his pleasure ransomless and free. His valor shown upon our crest today have taught us how to cherish such high deeds, even in the bosom of our adversaries. I thank your grace for this high courtesy, which I shall give away immediately. And this remains that we divide our power. You, son John, and my cousin Westmoreland, towards York shall bend you with your dearest speed to meet Northumberland and the prelate Scroop, who, as we hear, are busily in arms. Myself and you, son Harry, will towards Wales to fight with Glendower and the Earl of March. Rebellion in this land shall lose his sway, meeting the check of such another day. And since this business so fair is done, 
let us not leave till all our own be one. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. This was Henry the Fourth, Part One. Come back and join us again next Saturday for the continuation, Henry the Fourth, Part Two. Thank you very much.